Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I have to say, I feel a little bit like Terry Wogan, actually, um, having heard the end of uh, some music, um, but I'm not a DJ. I'm Gordon Carlson, and I'm your uh, IA national president. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 Information Day. I think we'd all probably hoped that we'd be completely back to normal at the moment, uh, but we're not completely back to normal. Um, things are definitely better than they were last year, um, and certainly there are far fewer people, as you will know, uh, who are very sick um, because of this terrible virus, but there are still plenty of people who are ill, and certainly um, we seem to have a considerable increase in the volume of people affected by it, and it's beginning to affect uh, services in other ways, simply that people are off. Um, so although the, the hospitals aren't full of desperately ill people on the intensive care unit these days, um, I know for a fact some of my colleagues, um, we're seeing significant reductions in the number of people available uh, to look after patients in hospitals simply because they're off with effectively a, a nasty case of the flu um, for a week or so at a time. Anyway, we are where we are, as uh, we often say. So what I would like to do is welcome those of you um, who are joining us online. Um, I guess, again, many of us are getting used to using Zoom, um, but for those of you who aren't familiar or who only use it sporadically, I would draw your attention um, to the bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, which allows you to chat um, with uh, people here. We can only have one speaker at a time, um, but we can have a chat. And if you look down the side of your screen, once you've activated chat, you will see comments and where possible those comments will be collated and we'll bring them up for discussion with speakers. Um, this meeting, um, like every meeting, is going to hear from patients living with an ileostomy or an internal pouch. But it's also going to hear from healthcare professionals and volunteers who support and work with individuals who have to live with an ileostomy in a pouch. The day is being recorded. I've already seen people asking for permission to record uh, talks, but if you look at your Zoom screen towards the top left, um, you will see there is a recording button flashing on and off. And I've been advised that the content of this day will be collated um, and then will be put on the IA website so people will be able to um, go back and look at individual elements. Um, I hope there'll be a few minutes for questions at the end of each talk, but there may not. Um, if there isn't question, if there isn't time for questions, then we will have a speaker panel later on in the day um, and we will have an opportunity put, to put questions to speakers, including myself, if you're interested, um, later on in the in the meeting. So um, I think without further ado, um, we should crack on. And what I'm going to try and do in a minute is I'm going to try and share my screen with you um, and um, explain what I'm going to talk about today, because it's, um, I think, slightly different to, to what we would normally, um, what would normally um, deal with in this kind of a, um, in this kind of a venue. I'm hoping you can all see that. Um, I'm certainly not aware that you can't. I can certainly see, and I've got screen sharing on. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about, rather than talking about medical matters, and rather than talking about physiology or how your colon works, and you get plenty of that from, from lots of other people, some of whom are far better uh, qualified than me to talk about it, I'm going to talk about the modern doctor-patient relationship, because I think the one thing that's true um, of almost everybody um, who has joined this meeting, and it includes myself, because doctors sometimes have to be patients too, um, is to look at what's happened to the modern doctor-patient relationship um, over the last few years, because I think it's important to recognise um, that there have been significant changes in the way doctors interact with patients. So um, just a few disclosures before we start. Um, I've been for some years uh, the chairman of the medical legal committee of a body called the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland. That committee is an advisory committee and advises surgeons on medico legal matters. Um, and those include their relationship with patients and unfortunately, occasionally lawyers. 
Um, I was director of a, of a company called the Surgical Indemnity Scheme, which was a company which provided doctors with indemnification, um, like the Medical Defence Union, for example. And I've also been involved in collaborations with uh, NHS Resolution. So when there is a complaint which results in a claim, that goes to NHS Resolution. And the aim of that collaboration was to try and reduce the number of claims by improving the standards of care. In other words, identifying where things had gone wrong and trying to stop doctors getting into trouble. I've also provided invited lectures for claimant and defendant solicitors to educate them about legal matters. And I've given an invited lecture for the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers for which I did receive a fee. Um, so, as I said, this is going to address how the modern doctor patient relationship has changed since Brian Brooke practiced medicine. Um, I thought it was very interesting when I went on Wikipedia. Wikipedia thinks Brian Brooke is still alive, which I thought was entertaining. Um, they think Brian Brooke is 107 years old and it would be wonderful if he was still alive. And I suppose you could say to a certain extent, he lives through the association that he created. But there was no doubt that Brian Brooke, uh, the founder of this association, practiced medicine at a time when the doctor patient relationship was very different to what it is now. And I thought it would be interesting to look at how it's changed and speculate as to what he might have made of those changes. So what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes or so are what are the key features of the modern doctor patient relationship. And in particular, I'm going to talk about consent for medical treatment why it's important in that relationship, who gives consent and when do they do it, what the issues of capacity are. I'm gonna talk about some legal terms and I apologize uh, for those of you who are particularly interested in those issues, but I think if we're gonna un understand how doctors and patients relate to each other, and in particular, how when you give consent for treatment, that consent has a legal basis. So we have to talk about issues called the duty of care, how that duty is sometimes breached, and in particular, how our modern relationship with patients in relation to consent has been changed because of one woman called Nadine Montgomery, a very brave and determined woman, who's, who's done a lot to change the landscape in terms of consent. So I think it's clear that the modern doctor-patient relationship is, is not the way it was. Um, I think I've shown pictures of James Robertson Justice, Sir Lancelot Spratt before um, in this meeting, but there's no doubt he was emblematic uh, of, a, of a type of doctor, uh, which is probably very seldom to be found now, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. The autocratic doctor who was paternalistic, who was arrogant, who, who said, the doctor knows best, I will decide what treatment you're going to have. And if you were the patient, you just went along with that. And that was a rather old fashioned view. Uh, it was certainly out of touch. It's certainly out of touch with current society. It showed very little, if any, respect for patients' autonomy. So patients were people who had things done to them on their behalf by people who decided what was in their best interests. And there's been a change over the last few years in society. The patient autonomy is very important. Physicians increasingly, and rightly so, I think, are seen as servants of the public. And when we make decisions about treatment, we make it as part of a team in whom the patient is at the centre of that team. We don't tell patients what treatment they will have. We offer them choices and help them make a decision as to what they want. And those changes are enshrined in the regulatory body. So here is the document from the General Medical Council called Good Medical Practice, which tells doctors effectively what they should do. And I just thought I'd share some of these with you because I, I hope they'll give you an insight into what is expected of your doctor these days. You must listen to your patients, take account of their views and respond honestly to questions. You must give patients the information they want or need to know in a way they can understand. And if necessary, that means you've got to communicate with them in a language they can understand. You've got to be polite. You've got to treat patients as individuals. You must treat people fairly, whatever their life choices and beliefs. If we have someone who believes the answer to their question is, is, is crystal healing and Reiki, 
you shouldn't laugh and show them out of the door. Um, you've got to respect their views, even though you may not agree with them. Uh, and what you should do is explain the impact of the choices they're making on the outcome of their treatment. And in other words, that implies a partnership arrangement with our patients so that patients can make decisions about their care, including what's wrong with them, what will happen, what the treatment options are, and the progress of their care and the doctor's role in establishing that. So this is just to summarize all about respect for patient autonomy. The doctor's role is not to tell people what to do anymore. It's to advise and explain and support. That is not a carte blanche. So if you go to your doctor and decide the, the solution to your specific problem is uh, perhaps the best beluga caviar every day uh, of the week for the next six months, you're not gonna get anywhere with that. It has to be about established principles of care but we have to, as doctors, support patients in caring for themselves to empower them to improve and maintain their own health. And that means advising patients on the effective life choices and supporting people to make changes to their lifestyle where that's appropriate. Another aspect of this is um, honesty and openness when things go wrong, because things, I'm afraid, often do go wrong. Usually they don't lead to significant problems, but occasionally they do. And when they do, the doctor's responsibility is to put matters right when that's possible, to offer a sincere apology, and most importantly, to explain fully and promptly what has happened and the likely short-term and long-term consequences of what has happened. That is known as the duty of candour. And um, I hope some of you will recognize the face at the top here, that is Professor Sir Norman Williams, who is a previous IA president. Um, and he and the individual below him, who is Sir David Dalton, and I've had the privilege of working with both of these individuals. Uh, I've known Norman for years, and David Dalton was my previous chief executive for 20 years in Salford. They were the authors of the document relating to the duty of candour, which ultimately was incorporated within the Health and Social Care Act. So that's a duty enshrined in law on the part of organisations and their employees, that means doctors, um, to be open and honest with patients and explain what happens when things go wrong. And sometimes, unfortunately, that is not enough. And those uh, occasionally uh, failures of care lead to legal claims. And what is interesting is when you look at those claims, they often relate to not poor care, although there often is poor care, but it's also because of the failure to communicate uh, patients uh, and their organized uh, doctors and their organizations with patients as to what has gone on. And when you talk to patients who have been on the receiving end, they're often they're, what's driven them to law is the fact that they just can't get an honest, straight answer about what has happened when a problem has arisen. And actually a relatively small percentage of cases, if you look at the total volume of activity, result in legal claims, but because there is so much activity in the NHS, that means about 10,000 claims each year are brought. And that's a huge cost to the NHS and therefore you and I as taxpayers. So I'm not sure whether you are aware of this, but the cost of outstanding compensation claims is currently 83 billion pounds in uh, 2019 to 2020. And that's at a time when the total budget for the whole of the care to be provided by the NHS was only just under 130 billion. So legal claims cost us as the taxpayers huge sums of money. So when these claims arise, a claimant has got to show that uh, the defendant, who will usually be a, an NHS organization, owed the claimant a duty of care and the defendant breached that duty, and that breach caused or at least significantly contributed to injury or damage, which was foreseeable. And since we're talking about civil litigation, we're not talking um, about uh, criminal law, we're usually talking about something called the balance of probability, not beyond reasonable doubt, but it was more likely than not, for example, that there was a breach of duty and that harm resulted from it. And these things are enshrined in the Health and Social Care Act. So duty of care is usually very straightforward when these things arise. It's usually the hospital trust who is the, effectively the employer 
And that duty may start before a patient is even seen in a hospital, for example, if a referral has been made. And that duty may also include um, the duty to provide treatment within a reasonable time frame as set out in national targets. That's all enshrined in the Health and Social Care Act. And the breach of that duty is what is central to most of these claims. In other words, um, it can be quite difficult to determine whether a breach of duty has occurred. And that's where lawyers and experts tend to make their, their money and spend all their time. And there are two tests which are employed here. And the most important one is this one at the top. It's called the Bolam test. A doctor is not negligent if he or she does something with a practice which at that time would be accepted as reasonable or proper by a group of other doctors, even though not everybody would agree with it. If there is a responsible body of opinion that says you, sh you can do this and this is a reasonable thing to do, then um, in that sense, there will be no breach of duty and a claim will not succeed. The court, and this is Belitho at the bottom, actually has the right to say, yes, but that's not logical. And that is, is seldom uh, brought into play, but it can be. So just to point out the standard of care that uh, we are entitled to expect of our doctors is not that of the very best doctor working in the very best center in a country or your country. It's that of an ordinarily competent doctor working at that level of seniority and practicing in that specialty. And of course, that does have implications for people who work outside their own specialty. So if your bowel surgeon decides to undertake a hysterectomy while he's at it, or vice versa, the level of care that a patient is entitled to expect is the same as a gynecologist undertaking a hysterectomy, or if a gynecologist decides to do a bowel operation, they may be able to do it, but you are entitled to expect the same level of care as you would receive from a bowel surgeon undertaking that operation. So in practice, what that leads to is if no reasonably competent doctor would have done or failed to have done that, and then the following harm happened. And where harm occurs, what's increasingly important to the medical profession is what's called a responsible body of professional opinion. So here are some guidelines that I just show them at random. These are standards of care which have been published. They're mostly actually available on websites and anybody can look at them, but they are standards of care published by professional bodies which set out the minimum standards of care for patients looking after the relevant patient group. They are guidelines in some cases, which means you don't have to stick to them. But if, for example, a doctor decides to depart from them, then you've got to explain why you've departed from them. And you might have to defend any harm that might result. So here's one I wrote in 2016, relevant to bowel surgery. If a joint is made and it doesn't heal properly, how you should prevent it, how you should diagnose it, how you should treat it. Um, here's one on how how doctors are supposed to look after acutely ill patients in hospital. So increasingly, the way doctors in hospital behave and the standards that are to be expected of doctors in hospital um, are regulated by professional bodies. Um, and should you depart from those, and it may not be the doctor that departs from them, it might be the organisation that doesn't provide the resources that allow a doctor to deliver that standard of care then they're gonna to have to explain why if harm has occurred because that leaves them in a very difficult position. So I want to talk specifically for the last bit of this talk about consent for medical treatment because I think this is the biggest change that we've seen over the last few years. And this lady uh, is someone again, I've had the pleasure of working with in the past. This is Margot Brazier who is now Emeritus Professor of Law at the University of Manchester, and she's written extensively about the interaction between medicine and the legal framework within which your doctors work, and specifically about consent. So I don't know whether you know this, but every mentally competent adult has an inviolable right to determine what is done to their body, and that includes simply touching you. So if somebody touches you without unpermitted contact, that is defined as a battery. So examining a patient, giving them an injection, operating on them without their consent, technically 
is battery. You don't even need to have injured somebody to have uh, for that action to have resulted in battery, which is a breach of civil law. More importantly, though, is consent. And I think the key issue here that I wanted to share with you are changes to the law on consent. And, and the issue here is whether or not we should be telling patients what treatment they might or should or could have adequately. So what's required is fully informed consent and a doctor is required now to discuss the risks, the benefits and all reasonable alternatives for any specific issue that may require treatment. And that should include having no treatment at all and its consequences. That is the law and that is what your doctor is expected to do. And again, here is a GMC, a General Medical Council document, which sets out the seven principles. Basically, everybody has the right to be involved in decisions about their own treatment and to be supported to make informed choices. It's an ongoing process based on meaningful dialogue. It's not just one conversation which is documented. All patients have the right to be listened to and given the information they need. And most importantly, and I'm gonna come on to this in a minute, your doctor has the responsibility to try and find out what matters most to you so they can identify the relevant information and about benefit and harm, including the option of having no treatment. Doctors have to start from the presumption that all adult patients have the capacity to make decisions about their treatment and care, and a patient can only be judged to lack that capacity to make a specific decision at a specific time, and there are legal requirements as to how that might happen. For patients who lack capacity, the choice of treatment has to be of overall benefit to them and should be made in consultation with those who are close to them or advocating for them. And a patient whose right to consent is affected by law should be supported to be involved in the decision-making process and to exercise those choices. So these issues are complex and they're often controversial and they're enshrined in a duty of care. Those issues are usually not the dominant issue, but they do come into play alongside often breach of duty in others when things go wrong. So quite often what you see is a patient said, when things have gone wrong, well, if I'd been told this might happen, I wouldn't have chosen to proceed with that treatment. So consent is only valid if it's voluntary and informed and the patient consenting has the capacity. And you remember I talked about the BOLAM test. In other words, that's what a responsible body of medical practitioners would agree. And that up until about 2015 was how the, the, the um, issues regarding the duty of care were concerned. So again, the GMC have commented on this and said that it's important that all reasonable options for treatment, including no treatment, are discussed and documented. And the standards used to be BOLAM. In other words, a surgeon has a duty to warn a patient about a small but possible well-established risk of serious injury. And if your doctor tells you that in a way that basically every other doctor would, then that would suffice previously. In other words, if it could be held, here's a consent form, for example, on uh, a groin hernia repair in a man. If these organisations, and I include the Royal College of Surgeons, a couple of colleges, in fact, the Association of Surgeons, if the general belief was that doctors told their, their patients about these risks and benefits, then if you fail to do that, then you would not be guilty of a breach of duty and consent. If you couldn't argue that, well, no doctors tell people that, or there is a responsible body of opinion um, that wouldn't tell a patient that. That changed, and there was a signal change in the way doctors related to patients for consent in 2015. So this lady is Nadine Montgomery, and this is her son uh, on the left. Her son was born with cerebral palsy. He got his cerebral palsy because of a condition called shoulder dystocia. That's where your baby is too big to come through a female's pelvis. So the child gets stuck in the pelvis, half, half in, half out, and it's unfortunately a well-recognized complication of shoulder dystocia that children can end up with brain injury. 
And Nadine was in a high risk group for this. She was a very petite lady. She knew it and she raised concerns and said, perhaps I'd rather have a cesarean section rather than a vaginal delivery. But she wasn't warned and she wasn't offered a cesarean section. And in fact, when she brought it up with the obstetrician, the obstetrician felt that a cesarean section was not in her best interests. He pointed out that the risk of cerebral palsy was only 0.1%. And this comes back to precisely the point I was making about autocratic uh, health professionals. It was not in the doctor's, it was not the doctor's responsibility to decide what a mentally competent individual, which Dean Montgomery uh, is, and certainly was at that time, was in her best interest. When her son was born with cerebral palsy, she made a claim, a claim for negligence. And that claim was dismissed in court and she then appealed and the appeal was dismissed and it was dismissed on the basis of what we call the Bolan test that I've referred to. In other words, it was established at that time that a responsible body of health professionals would have acted in the same way as her obstetrician had acted in saying, well, it wasn't in her best interest and the risk was only 1.1%. However, the Supreme Court looked at this and they said, this does not make sense. Doctors should be acting in their patient's interest and the patient ultimately has the right to decide what is important to them. Nadine's actually uh, subsequently, um, her message has been heard and understood very loudly and widely and her experiences have transformed uh, consent. What did Montgomery, and my Montgomery, I mean Montgomery versus Lanarkshire, that was the law case, lawsuit. Um, Nadine Montgomery's actions have helped to balance the modern doctor-patient relationship. They've made sure that healthcare is patient-focused and not paternalistic. Consent is not subject now to the same basis of duty as care as treatment, and the doctor is now under duty to take reasonable care to ensure that the patient that they're treating is aware of any material risks involved in any recommended treatment and of any reasonable alternative. And that means a doctor has to find out what a reasonable person in the patient's position would be likely to attach significance to. And the doctor has to be made, uh, aware, or at least should be reasonably aware, that that patient in front of them would be likely to attach significance. So a good example here is certain types of thyroid surgery can affect the register of your voice. Now you might not notice that change in normal speech, but if you're an opera singer, it might significantly affect the tone of your voice. And therefore, if you're going to do a thyroid operation on an opera singer, you might want to spend a particular amount of time trying to find out what is important to them when they come to their decision. And that requires doctors to communicate with their patients as individuals and find out what most happens to them. So to summarize, what would Brian Brooke have made of the doctor-patient, modern doctor-patient relationship? Well, we can't know because Brian Brooke is not 107 years old and he's not alive. But I think we might gain some insight into Brian Brooke's opinion of what I've just shared with you um, by looking at what he'd said when he was alive. Here's a book he wrote in 1956. He was well ahead of the game in communicating with patients. He was intensely patient orientated. Frankly, the modern ileostomy that as we recognize it would not exist, but for Brian Brooks ability to challenge dogma and sloppy thinking. And he was a great advocate. So what I'm gonna conclude, and I'm very happy to be challenged, but I'm gonna conclude that Brian Brook would have looked at what has happened over the last 20 or 30 years. And he would probably have approved any changes which rebalanced the relationship away from autocratic uh, doctors telling their patients what to do and forming a team which allowed doctors and their patients to decide and help patients to decide what is in their best interest and make sure they're fully informed about the choices open to them when choosing treatment. And I think at that point I've stopped a, li a little early. I think I've stopped about five minutes early or a couple of minutes early and, and hopefully um, we can um, maybe, if there is an opportunity, 
um, to have a question. I'm certainly happy to take a question. Um, and um, So there's one question that I'm going to uh, take before we pass on to Sophie. And again, we'll have the opportunity to talk about this issues, uh, these issues later in the panel discussion. So it's a question from Vicky, Vic, it says Vic Crane. Is it okay for a doctor to say the NHS is just there for serious life clinic problems? Can only reassure that there's nothing serious wrong, even with living in pain and discomfort. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I had Crohn's as a child, so I don't need my expectations of doctor's care change as an adult. Um, uh, basically, is it okay to be under the impression that um, the NHS is only there for life-threatening treatment? The answer is no. Um, and I would draw the analogy, for example, with hip replacement. Um, if you have severe pain and any issues, whether they be physical or indeed, for that matter, psychological, that adversely impa Im uh, impact upon the quality of your life, yeah, I don't think anybody in the NHS, however hard pressed, we might we might recognise that. Unfortunately, the priorities are such that, for example, dealing with an academic, we can't deal with this problem at the moment. And you might have to wait to see somebody to have these issues dealt with. But I don't think anybody um, would fob um, you off with a problem simply because it, quote, isn't serious or life threatening. What is serious to one person may not necessarily be serious to another. OK, so um, I think um, what we will do is, as I said, I'm happy to take questions and I'm sure all the speakers are happy to join the panel discussion. Um, but for now, um, we're going to move on to the next speaker. And the next speaker um, is Sophie Medlin. Um, Sophie is a consultant colorectal dietitian. Um, and I think we've heard Sophie before, who, who's given some fantastic presentations um, of huge interest um, to, to members of the association. She has extensive clinical lecturing and research experience. Sophie's chair of the British Dietetic Association for London and founder of City Dietitians, a firm of specialist gastroenterological dietitians and the Nutrition Academy, which runs, traces, uh, which runs training courses for dietitians worldwide. And Sophie's going to talk about how one can optimise gut health without necessarily having a colon. Sophie. Hi, Gordon. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for being here on a Saturday morning. It's a beautiful day outside. So extra points for being online and watching this. And it's such a shame we can't be in person. But given the rates that have been reported today of coronavirus, it feels like the right thing for sure. So I am going to try and screen share for you. It's slightly different to how it normally does. Hopefully that's all looking okay for you. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about how we can optimize gut health, even when you don't have a colon. And I think there's some interesting stuff in here. So hopefully some things that you haven't thought about before, things about different bits of your body that have got microbiomes that we can look after and things that might be new to you. Uh, again, I've not given this talk before, so I can't promise I will be have enough time to answer questions at the end of the talk but certainly I'll be rejoining at 4 30 to jump in and give some more talks uh, and more, answer some questions then. Gordon's given me a lovely introduction so I don't really need to put this slide up um, but just to reassure you you know particularly within the gut health space and also in the IBD space I guess online in particular there are lots of people masquerading as dietitians or people who might be nutritional therapists or nutritionists who uh, I would assume and hope have good intentions for supporting you with your diet and nutrition, but in general won't have the level of medical expertise or surgical knowledge as dietitians do. And dietitians are the only healthcare professionals who work within the NHS. So we've trained, I trained and worked alongside doctors, nurses, consultants, everybody else to learn how to support people when they've had bowel surgery or when they live with a bowel condition. Um, so just be really careful about who you take advice from in this space, uh, particularly uh, if you've had bowel surgery, because, of course, some of the gut health advice you might hear is likely to say things like eat loads of fiber and eat all these things. And for some of you, that's going to cause a lot more harm than good. So what is gut health? When we talk about gut health, there are two sort of camps, I guess, really. There's us medical lot who think about gut health as in, is your gallbladder functioning normally? Is your colon functioning normally? Is your small bowel functioning normally? Do you have debilitating symptoms from your gut or is everything okay? And then more recently, we've developed this kind of 
much broader understanding of gut health, which might be circulating or cent centering around the colonic microbiome in particular. And in general, when people are talking about gut health online, for example, they will be talking about the colonic microbiome, which houses trillions of bacteria and all sorts of other interesting microbial species. And of course, most people on here will be here because you don't have a colon and you don't live with a colon for various different reasons. So how can we optimize gut health if we're not thinking about the microbiome? Well, it's interesting and there's lots of things that we can, we can talk about and try and understand. But ultimately it's interesting to understand that you have a microbiome in lots of parts of your body. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Lots of you might be interested in gut health. And when you search for gut health or you're looking at gut health information online, you might see pictures like this, where there are, uh, you know, very slim people laughing at salads in their sports bras and showing off about how gut health is all about eating loads of plants. You might hear lots of stuff about probiotic supplements and you might think, should I take probiotic supplements when I don't have a colon? You might see things about eating fermented foods like cabbages and things like that. Is that something you can eat or should eat if you don't have a colon? Is it something you can tolerate? You might see things like this. So eating loads of really high fiber grains and cereals and dried fruit and nuts and things that again can feel quite inaccessible if you've had bowel surgery. And unfortunately, what often happens then is that for anyone who really sees those things and actually needs support with their gut health, people who perhaps have had surgery or have bowel problems, they realize they can't do any of those things. So it's not for them and they give up. And one of the things that I find really frustrating is how gut health, the term gut health, I suppose, and the way that it has developed has really been co-opted by the wellness community and although it's really great now that we can talk and there is an audience for people wanting to talk about bowel health and what's going on with their bowels, ultimately it's been turned into something that looks a lot like in an inaccessible health uh, mecca that most of us can't reach. And actually optimizing your gut health, regardless of your short, uh, long and short term gut conditions is absolutely available to you. And there are lots of things that you can do to make it better even if it doesn't mean, and it certainly doesn't mean having to spend how much of these things, 50 pounds a month on probiotics or five pounds for a box of cereal, that's not gut health. And we'll talk a bit about how you can accessibly access gut health or better gut health without having to make it look like it. perhaps sometimes we see it looking on social media. So we often think exclusively about the microbiome in our colon when we think about microbiomes, when we think about good bacteria and probiotics and things like that. Might, but it might surprise you to know that we have a microbiome on, on and in almost every part of our body. Within our nose, there's a microbiome and also in our mouth, down to our throat and in our lungs, there's a microbiome. Within our stomach, despite the very acidic environment, there's a microbiome and there's a microbiome in our small bowel as well. There's, of course, microbiomes in other parts of our body, including on our skin. If we imagine the mouth for a moment, the reason that we worry about sugar in the mouth is because sugar feeds the less positive bacteria that can then create acid in the mouth. The bacteria themselves are creating the acid that then creates the dental decay. When we have enough good bacteria in our mouth, then the bad bacteria don't live there. So even if we do have a bit of sugar, we still don't get gum disease. We still don't get the same kinds of problems. Within our lungs and our upper respiratory tract, we have a microbiome that protects us in many different ways. And I'll talk a bit about what it's doing for us in a minute. Importantly, at the moment in particular, when we're thinking about COVID and things like that, we can do things to look after our microbiome in parts of our body that don't include our colon. So what I'm getting at here is how important it is to invest in your microbial friends, even if you haven't got a colon. Again, within your stomach, we have a microbiome in there and they're doing amazing things in terms of protecting from uh, other bacteria getting in. So invasive bacteria that can cause harm. They're also maintaining the integrity of the stomach lining, all sorts of important things. And within our small bowel, there's a microbiome there too, which needs to be kept under careful control because otherwise it can lead to things like small bowel bacterial overgrowth, where the bacteria are eating more of your food than you are, and that can cause all sorts of problems. When we have a healthy microbiome in all different parts of our body, including in our small bowel and the rest of our, in our mouth and everywhere else, there's lots of things we can benefit from. 
One of the really important things that microbes do for us in our body is immune modulation. And that means knowing when to switch on an immune response, but really importantly for many of you who live with an autoimmune condition, also knowing when to switch off that immune response. So immune modulation is happening all the time from microbiomes that live in our nose, in our bowel, in our lungs, everywhere. And what they're doing is communicating with our immune system to say, everything's okay. Here's some extra immunity for you right now that you need. And this is when you need to shut it down because everything's okay again. So our, having a good, strong microbial um, support within our body is really, really important for managing our immune system, particularly uh, relevant in this group for ma making sure that it's switched off when it's not needed. We also know how important they are for mucosal integrity, we call it. So how well that barrier within your mouth, within your bowel, within your stomach is protecting you. And within your small bowel in particular, you've got these tight junctions between cells to make sure that nothing inappropriate gets into your bloodstream. And when your microbes aren't working quite so well, they're not creating that protective layer that they can do in order to stop anything getting through into your bloodstream that we wouldn't want to be there. That's also the case within your lungs and in your nose and in your uh, esophagus and everywhere else. So we want that really good mucosal integrity that we can get from bacteria, from positive bacteria. And that obviously leads to less infections if something can't get in, if those micro that's so invasive or um, aggressive bugs trying to get in, they can't get in because the microbes that we have are creating a barrier and protecting us and fighting them off. They're also anti-inflammatory. So a good, strong, healthy microbiome resists inflammation, protects you from creating inflammation in the body, whether that's inflammation in the bowel, within your pouch, for example, if you have one, within your lungs, within your nose and anywhere else. Not only are they supporting and protecting you from inflammation on the tissues that they're directly in contact with, but they also help to protect us from inflammation in the rest of the body. And as time's going along, we're learning so much more about how diseases or um, illnesses like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, these kind of lifestyle related diseases, even cancers are linked to inflammation and how therefore investing in our microbiomes can have such a profound protective health impact. Interestingly, I think it's interesting anyway, our microbiome has a direct impact on our mental health. So when our microbiome is healthy and happy, that is leading us to be able to harvest more serotonin from our bowel and get that into our brains. It's also constantly communicating with us, particularly that colonic microbiome, but other microbiomes in our body too, communicating with our brain and telling us when we're hungry, helping us to regulate our appetite, all kinds of amazing things. But we do know for sure that a healthy microbiome is generally associated with better mental health. So there's loads of really great reasons to invest in your microbiome, even beyond the physical. Within some territories, so in Canada, for example, they are using probiotic supplements, particular strains of probiotics, to Im improve anxiety and depression in adults. So there's some really great data coming through that those kinds of supplements and particular kinds of microbes can improve our mental health. And those that sort of whole school of research is called psychobiotics, which I think is a really great name. There are so many other things in terms of research that's happening right now, but I think those are the key things that are particularly relevant to this group and that might be particularly interesting to you. Uniquely for pouch patients, the microbiome that bit develops within the pouch is going to be really different to any other microbiome that exists within the body. So making sure that that's as healthy as it possibly can be is really worthwhile and has the potential, and there's no guarantee, but has the potential to support the reduction of pouchitis, inflammation, all of these things that people can experience when they live with a pouch. So what do we need to do to take care of a microbiome? Well, your microbiome loves diversity of plant matter and they want diversity of plant matter to be as healthy as possible. And one of the many reasons for that is that all of the different species that exist within your microbiome, whether it's your upper GI or your upper respiratory tract microbiome, your small bowel microbiome, in your pouch, wherever it might be, all of the good bacteria like to eat different types of plants. And by plants, I mean all of the plants we eat. So even things like wheat in bread and that sort of thing, potatoes, rice, they like fruits and vegetables. They also like nuts, they like seeds, they like pulses, they like all kinds of different things. And I'm gonna talk about making that a bit more accessible shortly, but they like diversity of plant matter. 
and all of the different species like different bits of plants like different types of plants and things like that like different even like different colors of plants so all the good guys love plants they may all like slightly different types of plants and slightly different sorts of bit, bits of the plant that you might be eating so the more different plants you can eat the more your microbial friends will be fed and the better job they can do in protecting you in throughout your body what they don't like, just like the rest of our body, they don't like red or processed meat. They don't like alcohol. They don't like sugar and they don't like sweeteners. So if there's ever a good reason to think about overhauling your diet a little bit and improving things, it, this is a good place to start. What I really want to highlight here is that I'm not suggesting that anyone becomes a vegan off the back of this talk. Um, the nutritional deficiencies associated with living without your colon are the same as are associated with following a vegan diet. So essentially, if you follow a vegan diet and you don't have a colon, you're doubling your risk of things like B12 deficiency and iron deficiency. So whilst I would love you to go away and think, well, maybe I could reduce my red meat a little bit, or I could reduce my processed meat like bacon and sausages and things like that, I'm by no means advocating or suggesting that you all turn vegan tomorrow. More plants doesn't mean cutting out anything in particular, apart from some of these things that your small bowel or your bacteria don't like so much. They really don't like stress. So just being conscious of that is really important. And I'll talk a little bit about stress management later because it's such an important thing. Stress has a big profound impact on or every part of our body. But one of the things that it does in particular within our bowel is it creates more stomach acid. It speeds everything up moving through our GI tract. And particularly if you live without a colon, faster and more rapid transit time is, is gonna be really unfavorable for you. But that increased uh, stomach acid, changes in pH in the digestive system, means that bac bacteria that shouldn't really be living in different places are able to access there. And that's where we can end up having more problems and, and uh, bacterial problems within our bodies that shouldn't really be there. Microbes really like sleep. So there's some good news for you. Having good sleep and good quality sleep is really important for supporting your microbiome. They obviously don't like antibiotics. And I'm conscious that many of you may live with conditions where you're having to have regular antibiotics for various different reasons, but it's worth bearing in mind that your microbes don't like them. And there are things you can do to protect them and look after your microbes when you are having to have antibiotics and afterwards. The other good news is they love exercise and Sarah will tell you very shortly about all the different sorts of exercise you can be doing and all the time you can be thinking as well about how much your microbial friends will be enjoying that exercise that you can enjoy doing too. So what I'm going to talk a bit about now, keeping an eye on time, is how you can increase plant diversity on a low fibre diet. So again, I am not here as one of the shiny, shiny Instagram girls trying to tell you that you need to be eating a massive bowl of salad and really high fiber cereal and loads of nuts and seeds in order to achieve a healthy gut, a gut health, gut health. I'm going to tell you some tricks and tips that you can use to improve your gut health through your diet without having any additional fiber or significant increased fiber within your diet. It's helpful to remember that every plant counts. And on the right hand side here are herbs and spices. And as much as I, again, I'm not going to encourage you to eat low chili. I know the harm that can cause people. Any herbs and spices that you add into your food, especially these brightly colored ones, are really helpful for supporting and optimizing your gut health. Your microbiome loves different colors. And one of the reasons for that is that each different color of herb, spice, fruit, vegetable, everything else that you eat has different polyphenols. Polyphenols are a bit like antioxidants, but they are the compounds in plants that dictate the color of them. So you can imagine the color that's in grapes, for example, red grapes, it's one called Reservatrol. In, uh, in blueberries, for example, it's another one. And they all contain different polyphenols that are really important for your gut health and can really support uh, all those different types of bacteria I was talking about. So every plant counts, including herbs and spices. So use them liberally and enjoy them, flavor up that food. Think about color diversity, really, really important. If you've ever heard me talk before, I'm sure you've heard me say to make soups and smoothies. If you're struggling with increasing the amount of fruits and vegetables in your diet, 
make smooth vegetable soups, pop them through a sieve, get rid of anything that's lurking around in there, make smoothies. If you need to put them through a sieve, put them through a sieve, get as many plants into your diet as you can. Some people might then think, okay, I'm going to have a bit of soup at lunchtime and then a cup of soup later, or you might have a cup of soup every day as an afternoon snack. You might have a smoothie for breakfast or you might have it later in the day, just really optimizing those plants. And again, with soups and smoothies, you can chuck any different fruits and vegetables in that you like, as long as they're blended and smooth, you won't have an impact on uh, if you have strictures or if you're struggling with your small bowel um, in terms of function. I'm a really big fan of encouraging people to try hummus, so smooth beans. So remember that your bacteria also love beans and pulses and lentils, which can be even less accessible to lots of people who live with a pouch or stoma. So hummus is great, dal is great, dal made with those split peas in particular, things like bean dips you can make and enjoy those with pita bread and that sort of thing. It's just another way of being able to add in some extra plants and perhaps some plants that you don't normally get to eat and then when you do get to have those, you've good, some of the new bacteria, the bacteria you haven't fed for a while are getting some food, the good bacteria, and they're going to be happy too. So we've got a new type of good bacteria getting some food and being able to grow and develop. Smooth nut butters and seed butters are also really great. And again, if you go to health food stores or places like that, you can get a mixed nut, nut butter. And you may even be able to get them in the supermarkets now. But that would be a really great way uh, of getting a few different nuts into your diet. And therefore, again, improving your plant diversity and feeding some more of those bacteria that perhaps don't get fed so often. We often get really stuck with eating just like wheat, for example. We're very dependent on wheat in this country. So that's things like bread and pasta. And actually, we could diversify that a little bit and use oats and barley and rye and some of these less common grains that, again, whenever you have them, you'll be feeding new bacteria that you haven't fed for a while. Even with if you want to make bread from oats, for example, just blend them up a little bit if they're too chunky and you're struggling with the fibre. You can work around these things a little bit and make it a bit more accessible if you do struggle significantly with fibre. Good news is your gut bacteria also love tea and coffee. So we don't want too much caffeine, of course, and that can really speed things up through the GI tract. But we know that your gut bacteria really loves coffee and particularly with teas, there's lots of polyphenols, those healthy compounds in there that really support our gut bacteria. So if you enjoy those sorts of things, they like it too. And that is always good news. There are lots of, because I'm conscious that there are gonna be many of you going, I can't possibly change my diet because uh, it's just not possible and I'm on a knife edge with it all the time. The good news is there are other lifestyle factors that I've talked briefly about, but things that you can do to improve your bacteria and your microbiomes, even if you can't change your diet at all, even if that's completely fixed. So we talked a bit about stress management earlier. Stress management is really, really important. And it might be interesting for you to know that hypnosis, cognitive behavioral therapy, yoga and meditation have all been used to treat irritable bowel syndrome really successfully. And I'm, I'm aware that none of you will have IBS as a primary diagnosis, but lots of people with a pouch or stoma will have some IBS symptoms. And so hypnosis in particular, but also CBT, so, so cognitive behavioral therapy, can have a really profound impact on gut function and therefore microbial uh, diversity and benefits within the bowel. So stress management, really, really important and worth exploring some of these more alternative things, things perhaps you haven't thought of before. There is a great app called Nerva, which is particularly focused on hypnosis for gut symptoms. So I'd really encourage you to check that out. It's got guided meditations on there for you and hypnotherapy tapes that you can try. Focus on sleep, optimize your sleep hygiene, we call it. So sleep hygiene is where you think about what's my bedtime routine? What am I going to bed at a similar time every day? Am I thinking about reducing my screen time before bed? Uh, those sorts of things. Sleep hygiene is really important for good quality sleep. And there are some great resources on sleep hygiene if you search for the Sleep Foundation online. Start with some gentle movement. Sarah's gonna to talk to you about this. Uh, for me, it's so important that you find something that you like. So again, through social media and other places, we can feel this real pressure to put a load, do lots of high intensity exercise and things that feel really hard hitting or 
work out every single morning at 5 a.m. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing exercise at all. It's just not the case. Your gut bacteria and your bacteria in the rest of your body are going to really benefit from any kind of movement that you do, including walking, swimming, yoga, stretching, whatever it is that you find works for you, then get on with doing it as much as you can because your gut bacteria and your, your general bacteria will thank you for it. Again, Sarah will cover lots of that in her next talk. And do try as far as you can to limit some of the foods that we know can cause harm. So look at the sweeteners, look at the processed food, um, look at the red meat, try and focus on reducing that as much as you can to improve your, to, to sort of support the microbial friends that you have got in there. And if you really can't change your diet, then you could consider a probiotic. And if you are, if you don't live with a colon, you'd be better off with a liquid probiotic or emptying the probiotics out of the capsule and putting it into your food or elsewhere. And the reason I say that is because the capsule that's put around probiotics, uh, probiotic capsules, is designed not to get released until it gets to your colon. So if you haven't got a colon and you want to benefit from those bacteria, get them out the capsule or um, use a liquid probiotic because that will help all of your upper, upper uh, <laughs> microbiomes as well all of the ones we want to improve on the way down as well as anything that's happening particularly in your pouch if you live with a pouch for example one caveat with probiotics and also fermented foods is to just be aware that if you're heavily immunosuppressed there is a theoretical risk that these bacteria could colonize inappropriately because your immune system isn't keeping them at bay so if you are someone who is on heavy immunosuppression uh, please do check with your consultant or your dietitian before you take a probiotic supplement. In summary, how am I doing for time? Pretty good. In summary, please think about optimizing your gut health and our micro and optimizing our gut health and microbiome is for everyone. It's not this exclusive club where you have to spend loads of money or you have to be able to eat a massive bowl of salads. It's for everybody and it should be accessible to everybody, in particular those who really need it, which is you guys. It doesn't have to be expensive or cause GI symptoms. So there are lots of things that we can do. And hopefully you've had some inspiration from this talk to improve your microbiome, even if you have significant GI dysfunction or problems. Investing in your microbiomes is more than just eating fiber. There's lots of things you can do. And if you can't do anything with your diet, please do focus on those lifestyle factors and you will still get some significant benefits. That is all I'm going to say today. Let me stop screen sharing. And I said, yeah, I've got a couple of questions in the box. Hi, Sarah, I can see your face. Um, let's see. So Vic, I'm just going to answer some of these in four minutes. Vic says, because we have no colon to get serotonin from, is it worth having antidepressants to replace this? Or are there natural things that you can get from missing serotonin? So there's no um, evidence that everybody who lives without a colon needs uh, antidepressants for sure. Um, you may notice that sometimes you do feel lower than you might have done prior to your surgery, but there's multiple reasons that that could be that won't all be linked to um you not getting enough serotonin from your bowel. So people might not know, but 95% of your whole body's supply of serotonin is in the gut. And it's not just in the colon, it's in the small bowel too. So you can still harvest some from there in theory. And we don't have great data at the moment about how the serotonin that is within our bowel actually travels up to our brain and whether it does at all, or whether it's doing more of a job in terms of regulating our gut function. So there's certainly no need, unless you are struggling with your mental health, to think about antidepressants. But if you are feeling particularly low, obviously go and talk to your doctor about that always. Someone's asked, so Janice has asked, any opinions on BSL-3? BSL-3 is a fantastic probiotic with some really great uh, evidence behind it. Um, VSL is, uh, is sachet, so it then becomes a drink. So then again, it can benefit your upper GI um, microbiomes as well, and one that's a good one if you live without a colon. There was also some really great data on VSL3, particularly in pouchitis, with some good data and outcomes. Unfortunately, it's expensive and it has been taken off prescription recently. So some doctors might still be able to prescribe it for you, but sadly it has been taken off. And the last question here is, what was the name of the gut hypnosis app? It's called Nerva. N-E-R-V-A, I think. Um, and that can be really useful. People are getting some really good benefits from it. So that's really nice. Oh, told never to eat red meat 
sources of iron to keep ferritin levels up yeah so iron can come so good quality iron can come from things like eggs it can still come from chicken it can come from white meats and things like that as well or it can come if you can tolerate it from dried fruit like figs in particular are a great source of uh, iron so don't give up on that for sure if you want to I don't know why you were told to never eat red meat so you could, most people still have it occasionally but just be conscious of that and last one, just had antibiotics and feeling worse, what could help? So yeah, invest back into that microbiome, look after it, follow some of the tips we've talked about today. And if you are able to, and you want to, you might want to consider a probiotic just to top yourself up again. And on that note, I'm gonna hand back to Gordon, who I think is gonna hand over to Sarah. Thank you, Sophie. I think that was terrific. I'm going to um, leave people with the disturbing um, piece of information that most of the DNA in your body in, is not your DNA, it's bacterial DNA. So actually we are not um, containers for bacteria. Um, most of us walking around are largely bacteria um, and we just happen to be um, you know, inhabiting uh, bacteria rather than the other way around, which is very worrying actually, I think. Um, and on that note, I'm going to uh, hand on to Sarah. Um, many of you, if not all of you, will know Sarah. Um, Sarah is a clinical exercise specialist and rehabilitation Pilates teacher with a master's degree in sports exercise science. Um, she's had an ileostomy since 2010. She loves hiking, climbing, running, cycling. She's run more than 34 marathons, which makes me feel very tired just to read it. Um, she's the author of the Bowel Cancer Recovery Toolkit and founder of the Ostomy Studio, where she teaches online recovery Pilates to people after stoma surgery. And she's the only woman I know who's managed to get me on the floor on an, on an exercise mat in the last five years. So I think that tells you something very special. Sarah, you're very welcome. And we look forward to hearing what you've got to say today about living with a parastomal hernia. Morning. Thank you, uh, Gordon, for that lovely uh, welcome. And I was just saying to my husband, because he sort of walked past a minute ago, and he said, oh, who's that nice chap talking? And I said, oh, um, Gordon. And he came into one of my uh, classes and laid on the floor in his suit and did all my exercises. So, um, yeah, that stayed with me. So, anyway, thank you. Right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am just going to try and get my screen share going. That takes me a little while to figure that out. It's a bit early, maybe, no, it's 11 o'clock, right, hang on. Let's see, hopefully that's working. Uh, I need to put it into, oh, hang on, bear with me, just need to move it. Right, okay, hopefully we can see, oh, you can see that. Yeah, right. it's come up, Sarah. It's, are we good? Yeah. Okay, I need to put it into presentation mode though, and for some reason, bear with me, talk amongst yourselves. Okay, all right, that'll do. Can we see that? Is that okay? I can see it. Perfect. All right. So, right, I'm going to talk about uh, living with a parastomal hernia. It's a slightly different approach to um, kind of prevention. So when you've been diagnosed with a parastomal hernia, and then how do we go about living with it? So a little bit about me, if you, um, if you don't know me. Um, so as Gordon said, I'm um, a clinical exercise specialist, clinical Pilates teacher, founder of the Ostomy Studio. Um, I'm also the clinical exercise specialist for the Ileostomy Association, and I regularly write um, the article in the um, in the magazine, which is great. Um, I'll just correct Gordon because I've now run forty five marathons. Um, not that that's to to make anybody feel entirely inadequate, um, but really just because it's just what I love doing. And I was kind of determined that when I had my stone, I wasn't going to let it stop me doing the things I want to do. It's not always easy um, and I'm not particularly fast, but um, it's really just, you know, what I do. And, and I'm not saying that anybody needs, out there needs to go and run marathons. It's just my thing. Um, right. So, Sarah, can yeah. I just ask you a quick question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know if it, the way it happens is, I had an emergency ileostomy, okay? Can I just pause?
pause you there and if I can just finish going through my presentation All right. and, and then we'll have some questions at the end or maybe on the panel later. Is that okay? Um, yeah, okay then. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's just recap what a parastomal hernia is. Um, so if we just look at these diagrams here, what you can see is the kind of the opening of the stoma, which has come through the um, abdominal wall muscle and then through the layer of the fascia and then the skin and we've got that opening. Then what happens when we have a hernia, it's just a little additional loop of bowel which protrudes through, it kind of follows that um, end of bowel through. So we end up with like these loops of bowel that sit between the abdominal wall and the skin. So they kind of get wrapped in, in this kind of hernia sac for want of a better word. So they're kind of your gut is, is outside of your abdominal cavity, so to speak, it's sitting in the skin. And those loops, you can have a little tiny, just one little loop, we can have multiple loops. And that is just where these kind of, these loops of bowel have come through. And, and sometimes hernias can be, can be very significant. Uh, a definition from the European Hernia Society is basically just an abdominal protrusion of the contents of the abdominal cavity through the abdominal wall defect created during the placement of a colostomy, ileostomy or ileal conduit stoma. So it's really a parastomal hernia is just where we've got these kind of lump, these, these loops of bowel which come through. Now you notice at the top, I've the definition of a parastomal hernia or PSH or bulge. So when I went out to Denmark to do some work, I was very surprised to find that they really just call them bulges out there. And to me, that sounds a little bit, a little bit less scary. So I quite like using the phrase bulge. So um, I tend to call them parastomal bulges. Okay, so here's a question for you. Um, how many people do you think get parastomal hernia? So out of everybody who's been given a, um, a stoma for whatever reason, um, and we're talking specifically about the parastomal hernias here. We're not talking about other types of abdominal hernias or inguinal hernias. Um, in your head, I'm not asking you to answer this question, but saying in your head, how many um, people do you think get them? And the answer is, we, we really don't know. The evidence is very mixed. So the research papers, if we look at, we look at all the papers that have been published over the years, it shows anything between 10 and 70% of people some surgeons suggest that they're inevitable eventually. And in some ways, a stoma is a hernia because we've pulled the bowel through the abdominal wall. Um, the Danes have done some really great research. They're, they've got a lovely database out there and they're following a lot of people with hernias. And we're doing the cipher study here in the UK, which will be really interesting to see what data comes out of that. They say at about 12 months, 36% of people with any type of stoma have got a hernia and maybe 50% uh, at two years. So they're very common and very, uh, very significant and, and really quite, you know, it's something that a lot of us will experience. I myself have got one. I've had it since I had my stoma in 2010. This small sort of lump appeared um, after my fifth surgery and you know, it's, it's kind of stayed the same ever since then. So I tend not to worry about it too much. Okay, so factors that influence uh, whether we'll get a parastomal bulge or not. And there are many, many factors. It's not just a case of we've done something wrong. It's a case of there are all these different things that play into whether we'll get one or not. Being um, as when we get older and maybe when we have our stoma formed when we're older. Also being very young, babies and very small children are much more at risk of getting hernias and bulges. The type of surgery you've had, um, the type of stoma you've got, number of surgeries, complications. And interestingly, the, um, the Danes found that laparoscopic surgery increased the risk. Um, now, we don't really know why that is, and Gordon may have a view, um, and we, we speak to him later. And um, being male, unfortunately, also increases your risk, um, being overweight, but also having a large abdominal girth. So you could be of a normal weight, but have a, 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 you know, a, a larger abdominal or waist circumference, and that would increase your risk. But equally, being very underweight and being very undernourished. And often those two things go together when we've had our ostomy surgery because um, we may have been very underweight when it was formed if we were very ill and then we gain weight 
and when we're eating normally and healthier again. And, and so there's, there's problems there um, with weight. And I'm not saying for one minute that being um, overweight is the only cause of parastomal bulges, because this kind of category of very underweight, frail people as well can be a problem. Um, we know that smoking increases the risk by about four times um, for obvious reasons with coughing, but also with kind of tissue healing. And the Danish research also found that um, drinking alcohol to excess increased the risk. Now, that's probably just part of a lifestyle kind of category. Having any kind of respiratory condition or COPD where you're coughing a lot, and obviously over the last two years with COVID, that's been a really big issue. So for many people, the first time they notice a hernia is when they get a cough or they get a chest infection. And maybe over the last couple of years, if you've had COVID, you found that your hernias become bigger or more bulging. Or in fact, you, um, you've developed one for the first time. Having a diagnosis of cancer, being on um, chemotherapy treatment, having diverticulitis, which was actually my diagnosis. Um, I had emergency surgery um, for that and, and AAA. So all those sorts of things where there's a, a, a sort of weakness within tissue, um, which may again increase the risk. Having many years of steroids and being on chemotherapy also seems to be another category. Um, and then we often talk about heavy lifting, and this is where I get really um, upset <laughs> because we don't want to be telling people not to lift because lifting weights and being able to lift things in your life is actually a really important thing because A, it's very disabling to be told not to lift anything, but equally, we need to keep our muscles strong for health reasons as we age um, to reduce our risk of osteoporosis, particularly in postmenopausal women. Um, and, and just also because it's very life limiting. So the issue with lifting isn't actually the way you lift or what you lift. It's something called intra-abdominal pressure. So IAP. So when you lift something and you brace, you increase the pressure in your abdomen. That's what the issue is. So if we, come, if we become strong enough to manage and moderate our intra-abdominal pressure, we should be able to lift safely. Having diabetes um, is another risk factor. Having an end colostomy, and there are other types of colostomies um, which probably aren't as relevant to this audience today because we're mostly ileostomies and pouches, um, but um, transverse uh, colostomies, which are much bigger in size. And finally, having kind of um, weak abdominal muscles or atrophy of the abdominal muscles, and that kind of sits with the underweight category as well. So, You've been told you get a hernia and it's, in my experience, it was kind of a, ooh, you've got a hernia, <laughs> some sort of surprise or, and then suddenly this feeling of kind of shame and embarrassment and fear and, and a sense of hopelessness and actually shocked into, okay, what am I gonna do now? And there's this big problem because there's so much online and so much fear and, and dogma around parastomal hernias, maybe some, People feel angry. Have I done something wrong? Will it get worse? What can I do to help myself now? And, and that kind of goes with poor body image, particularly if that hernia is, is significant in size. And I've had some clients that I've worked with over the last couple of years that have had some really significant hernias and you can really see what impact it has on their body image and the quality of life. Um, a sense of failure. So I've not managed to prevent getting a hernia which is why I tend not to talk about prevention of hernias because A, I don't think we can, and B, if we haven't managed to prevent it, then we've done something wrong. And I think that that uh, dialogue needs to change. And people are quite scared. And we know from the research that we've done and, and looking at the literature that once people are diagnosed with a hernia, they stop moving. And you may have experienced that yourself. So, you know, that, that again is a, is a really big, uh, is a really big problem. So you can see here on this little, kind of these two sort of circles, um, where we've got it, the blue side is the unhappy side and the green side is the, is the happy side. So at the top, we've got this diagnosis of a hernia, or you've got a hernia. Then we kind of go into this cycle of loss of confidence, mistrust of our body, what have we done wrong? Maybe we become a bit more inactive, we're told not to lift anything, we lose muscle mass. Maybe we have some pain or weakness um, around that hernia, um, or maybe we don't, um, but then we start to get scared of moving. And that leads to more deconditioning, reduced quality of life, and maybe poor health because 
exercise and moving is so important for our overall health. But here on the right hand side, we've got this kind of treatment, uh, we've got the hernia diagnosis and then where the orange arrow is, is okay, let's put an intervention in place. And that intervention um, would be some kind of core abdominal rehab exercise program. So we put that intervention in place and instead of someone feeling terrified and not being able to move or worried about what they can lift or how they should do anything, we start to increase confidence, better quality of life, Maybe people can return to normal life or, or a, a modified version of that. Um, and they're not losing as much muscle mass and they've got better health. So fundamentally, we need to kind of offset that fear and that diagnosis with something really positive. Um, comments from patients, as you've probably experienced yourself, you know, we're not really given any information on exercise or abdominal exercises or hernias post-surgery, apart from don't lift anything and wear this support garment, which is fine, um, but it's not hugely helpful. So you get a lot of people saying things like, um, you know, advice would have been really useful. I'm scared of exercising. Um, we're not told of the do's and don'ts. Exercise is important, but it's never discussed. I'm angry I was given no information on how to prevent hernias. Um, I wish I'd been given advice about hernias. I'm disappointed with the aftercare. So a lot of this goes on and we see this over and over again. So I did a Google search on parastomal hernia and this is what I found. This is the first site they came up and it was from some sort of general surgery website. Parastomal hernias develop gradually and they gradually increase in size. Well, that's not entirely true because mine hasn't. Um, they create discomfort and are visible beneath clothing, causing embarrassment. Parastoma hernias also create difficulties in attaching the stoma bag. Although rare, a parastomal hernia may cause the intestine to become trapped or kinked, causing intestinal obstruction, a dangerous and life-threatening complication. Now, if you read that and you've just been diagnosed with a parastomal hernia without any support or intervention, how are you going to feel? Pretty scared, I should imagine. So what is the effect of having a bulge? Um, what we know from the research and that the, the evidence that's been done is, is, is worse quality of life. Pain blockages, increased blockages um, around the bulge, um, pain around the bulge, and particularly as the, days go, the day goes on and the muscles become weaker and that bulge is, is kind of more, more uncomfortable. People become less active, often because they've been told not to be active and they've been told not to exercise. Um, become less social and work, work activities, um, worse body image and worse general health. So we need to kind of think about this in the context of our overall health as well. So my feeling at the moment is that we need a different dialogue around parastomal bulges and we need to find a way to live with them as opposed to worrying about whether we can prevent them or not. And we need to find a way to live in a way that's healthy. And of course, some, some hernias are going to need surgery, but for the majority of us, um, that's not going to happen. And in fact, the position statement from the Association of Coloproctology Surgeons um, recommend a non-operative management in most cases. And that's usually because the bulge will come back. And those of you out there who've had multiple hernia surgeries, I can really relate to that. And it's not, you know, we don't want to have to be going through that over and over again. So examples of non-operative management would be exercise, but that needs to be appropriate exercise. We, we can't just go around doing hip classes and Joe Wicks. We need to be doing appropriate exercise. Wearing a support garment, um, if that helps and it feels supported and it helps the hernia. Um, weight loss, if you need to lose weight. Um, and diet, lifestyle modifications. So it's not smoking. Quitting smoking is probably the biggest thing we can do. Reducing alcohol and eating a kind of what I would call a healing diet. So something that's going to really be promoting good health and promoting um, muscle uh, healing. So I'm going to tell you about something called the HALT trial. Um, the HALT trial was the Hernia Active Living trial. And I know that some of you were, were part of this. Um, and I was the clinical exercise specialist on this trial. It's a feasibility study. It was funded by the IA. Um, and it was led by Professor Jill Hubbard up at the University of Highlands. So we developed a series of exercises. And we took all patients who had already developed a parastomal bulge. 
And we gave people these exercises to do, and they were taught by myself and another exercise specialist. And we taught them online over Zoom during the lockdown. And um, what we found, so there were 32 patients in the, in the study, 13 of which uh, were in the exercise group. So we found no adverse events at all. So it is safe for people with a parastomal bulge to do these safe clinical Pilates based abdominal core exercises. And I'm gonna show you what they are in the workshops this afternoon. They're safe, they're appropriate. There wasn't an increase in pain or size of the hernia and it was feasible and acceptable. So great, we know it's safe and we know there are no problems, but it went further than that. The comments from patients were that, okay, we're not gonna make the hernia go away, but there was a sense of improved core control there was less need to wear support garments. They felt stronger, more confident to do things that they'd been avoiding before. The hernia feels smaller. And in a couple of patients, it actually was smaller. And they just felt stronger and more in control of their abdomen and their hernia. So quotes from patients, um, and these are directly from the patients from this trial. They were saying, it's definitely smaller, the hernia. I could feel everything was tightening up. And for somebody of my age, that's really amazing. We had one lady um, in this study who'd had a stoma for 44 years and she'd developed a hernia many, many years ago and she did this trial um, and that was her quote. And it really was quite amazing. So even if you've had your stoma for many, many years and you've got a hernia, it's been there for many years, there are still things you can do to help. Uh, I feel the best I have for 10 years. My abdominal muscles feel stronger. My posture is better and my hernia feels tighter. I'm enjoying it immensely. It will become a way of life. The biggest thing has been my change in attitude towards my stoma. It's no longer a negative thing for me. I control it. It doesn't control me. So we're giving people a sense of control, even though they may have quite a sizable, uncomfortable hernia and but that sense of control is incredibly important for your ability to be physically active and to have better quality of life. Um, this has really brought home to me the importance of doing behind the scenes things before you go off and do the thing you enjoy the most. And I couldn't agree more with that. So in the kind of stoma community at the moment, what I see is this kind of, this kind of um, polar opposite advice. So we've either got this, I better not do anything, I'm just going to be very careful, I'm not going to lift, I'm not going to do abdominal exercises. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, we've got this kind of go and just do what you want, live your life, um, and surgeons might say, I'll fix your hernia later if it becomes a problem. That's, we, we, want to, we, we don't want either of those spectrums, we want to find that sweet spot in the middle where we're doing appropriate exercise um, and supporting things that we want to go and do. Um, and then one final quote, I helped my brother move flats and we were lifting stuff around and I forgot my hernia belt and it was fine. I forgot my belt in the gym one day and I just carried on, it was fine. As long as I breathe properly, it's not a problem. So that's something I'm gonna teach in the workshops this afternoon is diaphragmatic breathing, correct breathing. Let me see how much time have I got. Right, so this is Tina. She has agreed to share her case study and this is her hernia. She had surgery in 2018, and by July 2019, she had noticed a hernia, and it started to increase in size. The surgeon advised her to lose three stone and to start core exercises, but didn't specify what or how. So during lockdown, she found out about the Holt trial, and she signed up. So she became enrolled, and she was one of my patients, and we did 12 weeks of one-to-one -one sessions on Zoom. And she now participates in my intermediate Pilates classes online. Now, with someone with a hernia of this size, she is symptomatic, she's having issues with it, and she is waiting to have surgery. So the temptation might be, well, I'll just wear my support belt and I'll wait and see. But Tina was adamant she wanted to do something to help herself while she was waiting. So she says by week seven, so week seven, it took a little while. This is not an instantaneous thing. This is something that takes perseverance. So by week seven, I felt confident enough to do the exercises said and to stop wearing the support underwear during the exercise. Now that's something I think is really important when we're doing this, this really 
subtle rehab core exercise. I advise people not to wear their support wear because you don't have that sensation of, of feel and you lo lose that sort of proprioception. So you don't really feel the muscles properly. So <clears throat> it took us seven weeks to get to that point though. So this is not instantaneous. Before my final session with Sarah through the Hulk trial, I was in the best shape I'd been for a long time. I can honestly say that joining the Hulk project was one of the best things I could do, I could have done to help with my physical and mental health. So having a hernia of this size is impacting Tina hugely um, mentally and her body image. And she says that just having that feeling of control over that hernia um, is really important for her mental well-being as well. So her final quote, I was in a pretty low place before starting the project, but after it finished, I felt like nothing was going to be a barrier for me that I couldn't manage. And that's huge because what we're doing here are the most simple, gentle core exercises. This is not, you know, jumping about doing Joe Wicks and, and high intensity stuff. This is really gentle stuff. I realized through the Hulk project that the stoma and the hernia did not have to control me. I was in control of them and this has helped improve my mental health. And finally, the one piece of advice I'd give anyone is take one day at a time. Listen, learn to listen to your body and make sure you have a strong core so you hopefully would prevent developing any hernias at all. Now, the difficulty is that we don't really uh, know if we can prevent them or not. Right, I'm just realizing I'm running over time bits. So I'm gonna rattle through. Um, so if we think about this non-surgical management, um, we need to be thinking about diet. And whatever diet that works for you, whether you've got obstructions around your hernia, but some kind of healing diet. Um, so something that you might increase your protein intake to help with healing. Uh, stopping smoking is the number one thing, but also minimizing any coughing or sneezing or anything that causes you to cough and sneeze. I would say would be a real priority. Weight management, core exercises, particularly around learning how to work with intra-abdominal pressure. And I'm gonna teach those in the workshops this afternoon and general strength, because the stronger we are in our limbs, the less we're gonna strain our core when we try and lift something. Doing some kind of rehab after surgery and wearing support garments or potentially, and this is something that I'm ex experimenting with, is using kinesiology tape, which is a sports tape, around the hernia to kind of tape it and support it. So um, just final tips, um, and I'm gonna, uh, we'll go into our break. So think about trying to engage your core when coughing, sneezing, or blowing your nose. Now that's, the advice is often given to hold your stoma. That's fine, but we need to learn how to actually get that engagement of the deep core muscles. So like a little bit of a brace, a bit when you pull your pelvic floor up, a little bit of an engagement there. And that's something you need to be taught how to do. Wear a support garment if it helps, but don't rely on it. It's only part of the picture. You could try kinesiology tape if you've got a particularly sizable hernia um, and, you, and you're having problems with support garments and, and your bag leaking, so you could potentially tape around it. That's something I've seen a few people do. Um, learn how to moderate intra-abdominal pressure through breathing. I'm gonna teach that later. And learn how to do correct core exercises and do them forever. This isn't something we just do for a few weeks and then stop. We do need to keep doing them forever and exercise. We need to strengthen our upper body, making lifting easier, but we also just need general good condition. Lifestyle stuff, losing weight, don't smoke, moderate alcohol, good diet, and treating any kind of cough, hay fever, asthma, sinusitis, nose blowing, anything like that, and avoid any straining. So if you're not coming to the workshops this afternoon, I'm just going to share this with you. Um, we've had some fantastic funding, which has come through a private donor, which means that we've got funding for 500 people to attend um, Ostomy Studio classes with me, my rehab classes, um, for free. So you can apply for funding to the Isle Ostomy Association to get eight classes um, and those are open to everybody with ileostomies, internal pouches, people who've had reversals and with hernias. And for those of you with hernias, I would really encourage you to come and do the classes because they're safe and I watch you like a hawk. They're suitable from three to four weeks post-surgery. So if you just Google specialist core rehab program, you can apply for funding. Um, there will be a waiting list. We're only taking um, six to eight people per month. Um, but there will be a waiting list, but if you speak to Caroline Bramwell at the iasupport.org as well. 
Um, I'm not going to take questions now. We're going to take them all as part of the panel later and I'm running to your break. I do apologise. So I'll pass back to Gordon and he'll take control, I think. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. That was wonderful. And it's generated a lot of questions, as you've probably seen. Um, we'll have an opportunity to discuss those at um, 4.30 this afternoon. Um, can I just make a plea for people who are involved in this um, to um, keep their, their own um, connection muted and to put their questions through for chat? There are several reasons for that. One is it becomes unmanageable and, and because of the way we're conducting this unless we do it that way. And secondly, if you if you put the question in, in chat, then it means everybody can see it, everybody can think about it and everybody can contribute. Um, so um, we're now going to take a coffee break. Um, at 11.50, um, and I think that gives us kind of 20 minutes, which should be enough for coffee. Um, please choose a workshop from the list that you've got in front of you. Um, can I just explain that the first one on that list, Sam Wilkinson's workshop, Back to Better Working, unfortunately we've had to cancel it because of illness, um, but there are the three other workshops, Better Living with an Internal Pouch, Gentle Core and Pelvic Floor Exercises for Better Living, which Sarah uh, is hosting, and Caring for Your Skin. Um, if you wish to join the exercise workshop, please make sure you have a mat or a towel to lie on. Uh, and please make sure you're wearing loose stroke appropriate clothing. Um, please do visit the um, exhibition. Um, please do interact with the reps in the exhibition. It's, it's really important. Um, it's important to us as an association um, that we maintain the links with our sponsors. So please do that. Um, and I think we um, all come back together again at 13.35. Um, to hear um, Raleigh Marinova, um, the pouch care specialist nurse, talk about pouches. So at that point, we'll, we will stop. Um, enjoy your coffee break. Uh, please enjoy the workshops and we'll see you at 13.35. Okay. We're just coming up to 25 to 2. So I hope everybody enjoyed the workshops, had a bit of time for lunch took the opportunity to go and to uh, visit the company exhibition areas. I do accept it's not the same as going to actually walk around an exhibition, but under the circumstances, I think it's obviously the best that we can do. Um, I'm now going to start the afternoon session by welcoming um, Raleigh Marinova, who's a pouch care specialist nurse at St. Mark's Hospital. Um, Mark Raleigh works in the stoma and pouch care team at St. Mark's, which many of you will know is a specialised centre uh, for management of patients with complex inflammatory bowel disease and in particular has a very large uh, and very extensive experience of undertaking ileoanal pouch surgery. Um, the title of her talk, Is That a New Pouch You've Got or Do You Always Walk Like That?, uh, is taken from a booklet published by the Ileostomy Association and intended to be informative and also light-hearted by Dick O'Grady, one of our members, about his and other people's experience with a new ileoanal pouch. So, Raleigh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we very much look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you. Thank you for having me today, and I hope everyone enjoyed their lunch break and the workshops. I'm just going to share my slides. Have you found it, Raleigh? Yes. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. Can you see?
Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Rali. I'm one of the pouch nurse specialists at St. Mark's Hospital. Today, I'm going to talk to you about life with the new pouch. The aims of today are to meet the pouch team at St. Mark's, understand what acceptable pouch function is, some hints and tips for new pouches, ongoing support we offer at St. Mark's, and how to be referred to our pouch team. Um, we have three dedicated nurse, pouch nurses at St. Mark's, um, Petya, Zara, and myself. Petya and I work full-time as pouch nurses. Zara, who is also our consultant nurse, works part-time as a pouch nurse, and the other part of her role is dedicated to her consultant nurse role and management. But she's always there to support us when we need her. Uh, interesting thing about the pouch team is that Petty and I are twins, as you can probably tell. Um, Zara is also a twin, but her twin does not work with us, but she also works in the same hospital. Uh, so it's part of the job description to be a twin. Uh, as you can see, our role is multidimensional. We are not only clinical we're not only directly looking after patients. So when we are not directly looking after you, we are probably doing something else on the back background so we can improve your care. So the clinical part of our role includes us providing care for our patients throughout their journey with stoma or a pouch before their surgery, um, in the hospital, on discharge, and once they go home. We will be there to support you when you first have your stoma, when the stoma is closed and once the pouch starts to work. And we will be always there for you. We also um, manage independently nurse-led clinics in face-to-face, -face, virtual and telephone settings. We offer ad hoc uh, clinics where we manage complications which of it prevents you from going to A&E or hospitals or having to see your consultants. We also have well-structured nurse-led follow-up for our patient post stomach closure, as well as annual reviews for our stomach and pouch patients and surveillance for some at-risk patients. And ultimately, we as well join our consultants in joint clinics when we have more complex cases. Research is a very important part of our role as it helps us improve our service and provide you the best care we can. Um, we develop protocols, pathways, guidelines. We also constantly develop our digital advice line with information for both patients and other healthcare professionals. We publish books. Many of you probably have our pouch book that was written by Zara, and we'll talk about it a bit later. We publish in national and international journals, and we conduct our own research and research with, uh, with other healthcare professionals. And we often might ask you to get involved or help us on research or other projects. Education is another important part as unfortunately, many of you probably have come uh, firsthand to these that not many people know about pouches. So we constantly need to educate people, including healthcare professionals. So we will do that through presentations on national and international level. Information days like this one today, webinars, uh, we are very involved and we support our patient support groups, and all these help us raise awareness and combat misinformation. It all it is something that helps us look back and see what doesn't work, or what might need some improvement, and what, on the other hand, works. So we do that through database keeping and feedback. We always would look into feedback from you because we learn some of our best lessons from you. So if you hear from us, sometimes it is because we want to hear from you. As, uh, audit helps us monitor the trends and tendency, any complications, 
and helps us improve our care. For those of you who don't know, uh, Ilueno pouch, it forms when your entire colon and rectum are removed and the pouch is then constructed from the last part of your small bowel, your ileum, and it's connected to the anus. There are different surgical options you might be offered. The most common that probably most of you have had or are offered if you're planning to go ahead for a pouch is a three-stage surgery. In the first stage, you would have your colon removed and antileostomy created. This is to allow some time for you to recover because this would normally be in emergency surgery. You would then come back for the pouch to be created and a new ileostomy to be done in the meantime is just to allow for the pouch to heal as well. And at the end, you come back for the stomach to be closed. And this is when the pouch would start to work. There are other stages of surgeries, two stage, which you might just go straight for the pouch being created at the, in the same surgery with ileostomy and come back. At St. Mark's, we also offer slightly modified version of the two-stage surgery. Which would have you would have your colon removed and, and a stomach created, and then you would have the pouch created without a covering ileostomy, and that would be your second surgery. And very few patients might have a one stage surgery, but this is very limited sel selection of patients, so it is not that common. And again, there are different configurations of pouches. The most common one is the J pouch. You can see their names come from the shape they have. There is also the S pouch, which is unfortunately more prone to complications, so it's not that recommended anymore. Some of you might have it, but it's not common anymore. And there is also the W pouch. It is an old pouch. Maybe some of you have it. Uh, again, it's a good pouch, but it requires experience and good technique, so it's not that common as well. It is important to understand that there is a careful selection before you're offered a pouch. As they are suitable candidates. At St. Mark's, we offer a pouch for patients with ulcerative colitis who are no longer responsive to medication, colitis-associated neoplasia, familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP, colorectal cancer requiring proctectomy, and undetermined colitis. This is when your team does not know if you have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, so it is not really confirmed. And even if you are part of this criteria, we would still uh, consider some other contraindications like weak winter muscles, as this might cause incontinence later on. Obesity, you might be asked to lose some weight. And again, Crohn's disease, we wouldn't offer a pouch to a patient with Crohn's disease at St. Mark's, as your risk for failure might be up to 50%. It is as well important to understand that when you have your pouch, your colon is no longer there, so you won't have the bowel function of a person with a healthy colon. So an acceptable pouch function, we call its range between four and eight times in 24 hours, which once or twice at night. You might have some seepage at night, because all your muscles relax at night, including your sphincter muscles. So you might have some staining on your clothes and this is normal. But that doesn't mean that you'll be rushing to the toilet. A healthy pouch shouldn't have urgency. It would time you would build up your urge resistance and you would see that you can wait enough to finish what you're doing, find the toilet, which is usually 10 to 15 minutes. Another thing to be aware of is that many of our pouch patients tell us that they cannot pass wind if they're not sitting on the toilet or lying down. So just to be mindful if that was to happen, it's normal. And again, before you reach that range of acceptable pouch function, 
you just need to be aware that initially after your surgery, your pouch would be a bit more erratic, you might be going to the toilet 10 to 15 times a day. And the output of the pouch might be a bit more liquid and it might lead to some sore skin. So uh, it is important to keep the skin around your bottom clean. So that's something we'll discuss a bit later. So, so you might also have some incontinence or urgency initially, but usually we manage that with low fiber diet, some medications like lupromide and codeine. And again, urge resistance, which is you slowly building up this resistance to go to the toilet. And it is important to know that this is all normal. There will be a period of bowel adaptation which would really mean you becoming confident with your pouch. But we'll be here for you, we'll support you. So it is all normal and it would get better. Today, we're gonna talk about some of the most important topics that we find when new pouches have after surgery, is bowel adaptation and retraining, diet and hydration, perianal skin care, and wind management. And again, you need to remember that we'll be here for you. And about adaptation and retraining, when your stomach is closed, this is when your pouch would start working. This is the moment when you would need to train your pouch. When we say that, we mean pouch compliance and urge resistance. And with that, we really need, mean that initially you might have some uh, increased pouch frequency, some incontinence and urgency, but you would see with time that you would start to understand what this means. You would just need to train your pouch. It usually we notice that that adaptation period takes between one and two years, but that doesn't mean you're gonna have problems for two years. Usually immediately after surgery, the next few weeks, you would start, things would start to settle in the first three to six months, people already have a good quality of life with their pouch. And you would as well need to retrain your brain. With that, what we mean is initially after surgery, every time you need to go to the toilet, your brain would tell you that you need to rush because you need to go. But with time, you would see that you can actually finish what you are doing. You can then wait gradually 5, 10, 15 minutes before you go to the toilet. Again, you would see that this is something that would happen with time. With time, you would need to become a bit more confident. So when we say one, two years, it's really that period that you would need to become more confident and understand what the different signals mean and what your pouch is really telling you. The important thing is the correct sitting position on the toilet. This is the correct pouch position. You need to have your knees above your hips, your uh, elbows on your knees, and you want to have your back straight. And when you are in this position, the muscles around your pouch relax, and your pouch empties easily, so you don't have to strain, which is something you wouldn't recommend. If you see that uh, when you sit for, on the toilet for five minutes and nothing is happening, it's better to just stand up, massage your abdomen, try again. But if you ne really need to sit more than five minutes, just walk away and just come back. You shouldn't really strain and sit there for 30 minutes. And again, things will get better. So it is all normal. It's part of the adaptation of your pouch and we'll be here to support you. So it is something that will take time, but you would see that it is initially a bit more problematic, but the more you learn about your pouch, the more confident you become. So when you have your pouch, you won't have your colon anymore. Most of you would be already on a diet that is similar you would have had your ileostomy. So the diet with the pouch is similar, but just because you just had the surgery, you need to go a step back and go to the basics and gradually progress. 
when we say that you don't want uh, foods that are irritant for your bowel, you want to be on low fiber diet, you don't want to have spicy foods, deep fried food or processed foods because all these foods um, stimulate your bowel to contract more. So you tend to, to go more often to the toilet. And this is something that we would usually recommend, especially for the first six, eight weeks how things are settling. So things like a brown bre bread, pasta, rice, wheat, bix is better to avoid. And again, these are tables with foods that we recommend usually to include and avoid, but everyone is individual and you would see with time after the six, eight weeks, you can start introducing foods one at a time. Just you always need to be mindful with a pouch and ileostomy with some foods that are more difficult to digest, as they might cause a blockage, so things like nuts, mushrooms, stuffed meats. Doesn't mean you shouldn't eat them, just be more careful, especially initially, and chew your food well. Hydration, especially initially, again, when you after your surgery, your pouch is more active. You go to the toilet more often, it is important to stay hydrated. So again, you want to avoid drinks that irritate your bowel. So things like alcohol, too much coffee, fizzy drinks, you just avoid them initially or don't have them too much. And instead have drinks that are better for you, like water, squash, non-fizzy drinks, or it's important as well to have a liter and a half, two liters of fluids a day. Another thing we always tell you is to add some salt to your diet. The salt helps you keep fluids in your body rather than you expelling them through the pouch. And low fiber, again, it is important, as, as I previously said, high fiber stimulates your bowel to contract more and for your digestive system to work more. So you don't want it, especially initially, or every time your pouch is more active. Because if you lose too much fluids, you might become dehydrated. Again, these are fluids that every time you see that your pouch is more active than usual, it is good to have at hand. This is our St. Maximix solution, specifically designed to help you stay hydrated. It's and probably many of you have it or have tasted it before. It's not the best taste, uh, but it helps to put a splash of squash or keep it in the fridge. And then you drink it throughout the day. The Aralite is another option. Just to be mindful with the Aralite, it has potassium. So in the long term, or if you have it too often, it might raise your potassium levels in your blood and that might become dangerous. Clean of skin, it's very important, especially initially, again, because your pouch is more active, you tend to go to the toilet more often, and the consistency of your output might be more liquid, so it might lead to soreness around your bottom. So it's important to keep the area clean and dry. We always tell you, use a good barrier cream. Would usually, we would send you home with a barrier cream, so you have, you don't need to look for one. And with the barrier cream, it's important as well to know you need to put small amount. You don't need too much around your anal canal, but as well a little amount inside it just to protect the lining of your anal canal as well. So, so when you're out and about, we often tell you to have cleaner contact and wipes. These are moist wipes. They also have a barrier, so they keep the area clean and they also protect it. Some people use bidets, they are bidets that are portable, or you can have one at home. So what they do, they use it every time they open their pouch just to clean the area. Another helpful thing is to thicken your pouch output. It will usually happen with diet, or sometimes we might tell you to have medications such as paramite. And you need to know that some foods might actually, might actually cause itchiness or burning, like citrus fruit or 
spicy food. So just be mindful when you have them. It is so some people suiting to have to wear loose cotton underwear or to sit in shower bath of Epsom salt for 10, 15 minutes. It helps with the area. As I said earlier, many people with a pouch find it difficult to pass wind if they're not sitting on the toilet or lying down. This as well, you need to know that foods that were causing wind before would continue to do that even now that you have your pouch. So things like broccoli, leafy greens, beans would still lead to some wind. So just be careful with them. We don't we won't tell you not to have them, but just when you do, just you should know that that might happen. And with wind, it's always important to chew your food well, avoid chewing gums. Fizzy drinks might as well increase wind, drinking to a throw, and also skipping meals. Many people tell us that they would skip meals because they don't want to go to the toilet, but when you do that, that might uh, cause some wind as well. And these are some things that people find helpful, peppermint water, capsules or oil, or some charcoal tablets, these also work. And ultimately medications such as semeticone also are useful. And this is our St. Mark's pathway. It shows how we see our pouch patients when they initially have their surgery, how we follow them, uh, as well how we see them after their stomach being closed and the pouch starts to work, as well we see annually some at-risk patients for surveillance. And this is also for our pouch patients that might end up losing their pouch. Again, because we know that this period of adaptation might be difficult and you would need extra support, we tend to see you more often in the first year of your journey with the pouch. So initially we would see you at six weeks, three months, six months, and 12 months. And of course, as required at any time, in telephone, virtual, email, face-to-face -face clinic, so we can support you when you need support. Because we do realize that the pouch is a new thing. You would need to train it, and we will be there for you when you need us. So just to keep that in mind. We've actually just, our pouch team published a uh, research on our novel follow-up for patients with a pouch after stomach closure. It was actually just published yesterday at the British Journal of Nursing. So we asked our patients with the pouch what they thought of the way we see them after their stomach closure and overall people were happy with the way they, we see them. But with that being said, we would still need uh, more engagement and in investment so we can continue to provide this service. Research also showed us that overall, after the six, 12 months, the quality of life of our pouches is improved. You would have an approximately six to eight times opening your pouch in 24 hours. Also improved sense of urgency, reduced episodes of seepage, reduced dietary and social and work restrictions as well. So as you can see, things will get better as time passes. So it's just to be positive. It's a bit scary at first, like everything else. If you drive a car or you ride a bicycle, if you can remember the first time you did that, but now you just do it automatically. This is our pouch book probably many of you have. If you don't, here is some information how you can obtain it. Our pouch book was written by Zara. It's a great tool. It helps you prepare for a pouch surgery. It has a section on stoma and on pouch, and it's been essential too during the pandemic 
to help us guide patients through how to manage complications remotely when sometimes we wouldn't be able to see them in face-to-face. -face. Again, you can, if you don't have the book, this is the email. Um, we ask for 10 pounds, which, which are used after that for reprinting and redistribution so other future pouch patients can have the book as well. And uh, many of you always ask us in this uh, information days how you can be referred to us. We would need a referral from your GP or your local colorectal or gastroenterologist consultant. We've actually recently created an information leaflet, which is also in digital form, so we can easily provide it to other healthcare professionals or patients, so that would help them. Once we do that, we would ask you to also complete our pouch care passport, which essentially is a booklet where we would ask you to provide your personal details, any allergies, any medications you might be taking, any other conditions you might have, and again, your stomach or pouch function, depending on what you have. This thing helps us have your up-to-date medical and surgical history and any medications you might be taking so we can provide the best care for you because sometimes when you just ask for advice we can't just provide that without knowing your background and what other conditions you might have and this is our contact details this is our telephone our website and our email address. So you can contact us there if you have any questions. And this is our QR code, which you can scan. It leads directly to our website, which I can show you now. Can you see? Hmm? Can you see it? Not yet, Rally. Just give me a second. Yeah. On. So this is our website. You can see our storm and pouch team there, our department objectives, our vision. This is our stoma team and our stoma patient pathway and how we see our stoma patients after they have a stoma. This is also our stoma book with information on how you can obtain it. You have all the information here. You can also download some patient leaflets with information on different topics and information on support groups. And this is our pouch team. You can see information on how we see patients in clinics, what we see how we see independently patients and sometimes with the consultants. Again, this is our patient pathway of how we see you when you have a stoma and once the stoma is closed. And our pouch book and information on how to obtain it. Again, some if leaflets for patients and support groups information. I'm just gonna quickly switch, sorry. Thank you, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm not sure we'll have time now, but later on we'll have a workshop where we can answer more of your questions. Thank you, Rali. That was a fantastic overview of, of, of care for, for individuals who've had pouch surgery. Um, I should say from the center in, in the UK who pretty much pioneered uh, pouch surgery in the UK. So I think you, you've heard from the best uh, as far as I'm concerned in, in, in relation to those issues. Um, and as Raleigh said, we'll have um, hopefully plenty of time for questions um, later on today. So thank you, Raleigh. Thank you. Um, it gives me a very considerable pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Callum Lyon, 
um, who is going to give this year's Brian Brook lecture. Um, Brian Brook, as, as you know, was the founder of the Iliostomy Association. Um, and Brian was a surgeon and he specialized in surgery for inflammatory bowel disease. And he had this incredible um, simple concept, which interestingly had pretty much um, evaded everybody's imagination at the time he came along, which was to deal with the problems created by uh, an ileostomy, which in those days, uh, before Brian's intervention, was a flush stoma and caused terrible problems for patients. He had this great idea of just bringing it out and creating a spout, and in doing so, um, had considerably changed the landscape for patients with ileostomies, particularly in relation to problems with the peristomal skin. Uh, and therefore, I, I thought it was particularly um, useful and valuable and of interest to, to members um, to hear from Callum Lyon, who's pretty much, I think, created um, a, a new specialty, which is peristomal dermatology. Uh, and Callum has very much uh, made that his own um, and been hugely influential in thinking about um, peristomal skin care. Um, Callum graduated from the University of Cambridge in 1992. He trained in dermatology in Salford Royal Hospital, a hospital that I've been very proud to have been associated with for about 30 odd years. Um, Callum then became consultant dermatologist in York in 2001, although I have to say he's maintained very close links with my colleagues and I in Salford uh, and developed a special interest in peristomal dermatology, including cancer and skin surgery. Um, and he's published more than 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals. He's written chapters in four major, uh, major textbooks, and he's published uh, an atlas of skin disease uh, relating to abdominal stomas, which I, here is, is not just an issue that stoma nurses. I think we all, anyone involved in, in um, colorectal surgery who has patients with stomas finds Callum's uh, atlas incredibly useful. So we're very lucky to hear from Callum today, and it's a great honour uh, to be asked to invite Callum to give the 2022 Brian Brook Lecture. Um, Callum, uh, I can't see you actually on the list here, but I, I hope you I, are I here. Should be there. I should be there. Brilliant. There you are. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the floor, figuratively speaking, Callum, is all yours. Right. Can you see the, the talk? not as such okay i shall share the screen then somehow or other um, at the bottom usually can you see it now yes brilliant thank you good there we are we got it okay um so i always wanted to be <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me a gp or possibly a surgeon but um dermatology became my thing and this just out of interest is a ukrainian silver blessing cup or kiddish cup that i bought for my wife for christmas and what i was going to talk about was the history of what we did and what what relatively what's new i was going to talk about the ph of skin and what have you granulomas and how we've trained the nurses to do surgery and pyoderma gangrenosum, our use of Botox and a bit of term of teledermatology and some common skin conditions. And I don't want to gross everybody out, but uh, this was the first dermatology patient I ever saw. He was from a place called Pripyat next to Chernobyl. And her parents were convinced that it was radiation that had caused her skin problem. And I don't think it was, but, uh, Rather sadly, they had to leave in spring because they had to plant potatoes, otherwise they'd have no vegetables for the uh, the following autumn. And it's very similar to what's going on at the moment. So historically, um, what we discovered was approximately two thirds of people with stomas reported a skin disorder which stopped their bag um, sticking properly and caused leaks and most people thought it was allergy even this which is actually I think called pyoderma gangrenosum so we set up a clinical study to uh, try and improve the 
understanding on, uh, of the nature and management of skin problems around stomas and to improve the service uh, to patients by uh, a joint approach between dermatology uh, and the stoma nurses and the surgeons like Gordon. And if you can see that picture, that is the storeroom of the stoma care department. And that's where we had our first clinics. It was tiny and it was the only place that we could get um, to actually see people. So we, having set up this audit, since the end of approximately 1998, we've run a monthly clinic in Hope Hospital or Salford Royal as it's now called, staffed by me, a registrar and two or three specialist stoma care nurses. And I've also run something similar in York since 2001. And we accept referrals from GPs, hospital doctors, stoma nurses, anywhere in the UK, and self-referral from patients nowadays from anywhere, but mostly from people who've had their surgery done at Salford. There's also a weekly drop-in clinic run by the nurses who are um, very um, experienced um, and also can approach one of our dermatology registrars if they need a prescription but we actually have two nurse prescribers now so it's not so critical. So what we discovered is not particularly surprising in you know with the benefit of hindsight a large proportion of the skin problems that we've seen are related to irritation so irritation because of contact with feces or urine on the skin and then there's a whole range of things uh, like seborrheic dermatitis and psoriasis which are related and they're very common in the context of inflammatory bowel disease they're twice as between two and four times as common in people with Crohn's uh, compared to the general population and then infections and eczema and overgranulation, which I'll show you granulomas basically and then um, parastomal pyoderma gangrenosum is much, much commoner than you'd expect. And I'll tell you about that later. Allergy is actually quite rare. It's less than 1%. It's a, overall, it's about 2% at the moment. But when we first did the study, it was about 0.7%. CPD is to do with the urostomies. So I won't, I won't go on. I won't discuss that further. So we've seen over... Nearly 3,000 actually new patients have been seen in our clinic in, in Salford, ranging in age from toddlers to people at the end of life. And there's approximately equal male-female ratio. And these three girls here agreed to uh, have their picture shown <clears throat> in order to improve the understanding of um, um young patients in particular who require stoma surgery. So it, things haven't changed very much. In our original study, it's about 20% of um, problems that we saw were urostomies and about 50% ileostomies. And it's not really much different, to be honest, uh, in the last 10 years. We also see a range of other ostomies like gastrostomies, um, um, jejunostomies, nephrostomies and fistulae and quite a lot of non-stoma patients with complex wounds, Crohn's disease etc and this is just an example of the things that we get sent that aren't to do with stomas and this is somebody with a, a dehist or broken down abdominal wound which requires a bit of um, dermatological input and then we get people with Crohn's, perineal Crohn's, um, perianal Crohn's and genital Crohn's, such as this poor woman, who's sadly no longer <coughs> with us. Uh, really nasty genital Crohn's and perianal. And so it's very rewarding to do this, uh, so, uh, this clinic because it's interesting and you can make a difference, but also you get to travel to places like Niagara Falls and um, Singapore, Rome, Denmark, etc. And uh, just to show you some of the pe people, the, the lady in the top right hand corner was the one that started it with me called Rachel Smith or Ray Smith. And uh, she was much, much happier than she looks in that picture. And um, 
very chirpy and she was the one that actually got us started uh, at, with the joint project and Mandy there you can see in the middle here um, who's recently semi-retired and there she is again and that's the team at the time when we went to Budapest so we do have quite a, an interesting time with it. So the diagnoses over the last 22 years or so, um, irritation reactions are still about a quarter of things, granulomas, which I'll talk about, and then psoriasis and seborrheic eczema, infection, ex ordinary eczema, pyodermic gangrenosum, allergies, about just under 2%. And then we see a range of genital and perineal disease and a few rarities, which I won't go on about because they, they really are rare. And uh, we've increasingly provided telephone and email advice to people, um, both patients directly and their stoma nurses or doctors or surgeons in other parts of the country. That's where I live, just there. I'm sat in a room just there at the moment. So, um, this is just to give you an example of why it's a problem. If you look on the left hand side, that is a normal anal canal and it, it progressively changes from um, bowel to skin with lots and lots of um, musculature and grease glands to waterproof it, etc. And if you compare that with uh, an ileostomy, which was removed by Gordon, in fact, um, you can see there's an actually very abrupt change from skin to bowel. And you can see that there's a lot of, uh, if I show you here, blood vessels, and that's why it's red. And the skin's very thick because it's irritated slightly. And it's very abrupt compared to the anal canal, which is very gradual. And that's why, uh, partly why we have problems with the skin, because it's not adapted for what it has to deal with. And that's why it becomes um, an issue. The skin itself is um, normally has a pH, uh, an acidity uh, level of about four to six, roughly. And um, that is produced by the, the grease that is released into the skin and the sweat. And that protects against bacterial infection, damage. And if the pH, the acidity dwindles, it goes more towards neutral or alkaline, it becomes quite a problem because the skin then breaks down and becomes more likely to be infected and damaged by bacteria and damaged by irritation and to lose water in such a way that it can't recover. If it, if it continues, the skin actually suffers quite significantly. So if we think about the, the food journey, all the way from a lovely uh, main course to some chocolate rice crackers and urine, the pH um, is, is quite significantly different. So if, if you think about very acidic, like battery acid or stomach acid, um, or lemon juice, tomato juice, etc., all the way up to baking soda and ammonia and bleach, etc. The urine itself is roughly neutral, and I won't discuss that further. But the jejunum, um, the very, very proximal small bowel, the very first part of the small bowel, is um, is quite um, alkaline initially because it's neutralised by juices that come out of the pancreas. So the gastric contents are very acidic and they're neutralized with bicarbonate that comes out of the pancreas. Although having said that, I've recently had a, a, a young man from Harpenden who um, has got such a very short stoma that it never ever um, neutralizes properly. So the contents of his stoma effluent are actually still acidic. But proximal ileum is more acidic, uh, more alkaline, sorry, and the colon is slightly more neutral. So these things in contact with the skin will damage the skin by changes in the pH, which is the pH is basically the concentration of hydrogen atoms within 
uh, the fluid. So you can see the pH. So when we talk about um, buffers, it's it, a buffer is something which delays the or, or modifies the shock of something. And in terms of buffer solutions, this is a mixture of a weak acid and a weak alkaline, and they stop a massive change in pH um, when something acidic or alkaline is added to the system. And that is uh, relevant particularly to stoma bags. And the reason is that most, the, the original stoma bag material was a mixture of um, carboxymethyl cellulose and pectin. And this acts as a buffer which maintains a pH below seven. And it's quite a weak buffer, so it doesn't last for very long, but that was basically how it worked and it's a wound dressing. So the, the problem with in terms of um, skin and stomas is if bowel contents get on the skin, everyone thinks they're burning it because they're acidic, but they're not acidic. Most of the time, they're actually more alkaline than acidic. And in that situation where they're more alkaline, the enzymes, particularly in ileostomies, uh, are more active. So when it becomes acidic, properly acidic, the enzymes don't work. Uh, they're more functional around about the neutral pH, about seven. And they in a more uh, neutral pH, they will tend to digest the skin and damage it. And that is why you get a burn effectively. So you get enzymatic degradation of the skin, which damages it. So there are a few new stoma barriers, which are designed to buffer the pH better um, so that the enzymes are inactive at the skin surface and that the acid mantle of the skin, which is what we normally have, is uh, protected and you'll you'll have heard about this if you go to beauticians and boots and what have you you've got ph 5.5 skin protection creams etc and they're designed to keep the ph acidic so that the skin is better protected and just as an example this is a patient from aberdeen i was asked by um a teledermatology referral could i do anything about this did I know what it was and I just said well it's 50% domestic vinegar so basically any sarsen's vinegar mixed with water and applied to the skin for a few minutes and it completely corrects it within a few days or a couple of weeks maybe um, it gets rid of the problem and as another example this is a patient who was in York Hospital with a fistula with the same surname as me uh, a very locally famous sculptor and he wasn't allowed to leave the hospital till he could keep a, a bag on his fistula for at least 12 hours and so basically what I did was I got some of the little sachets of vinegar off the catering trolley in the ward mixed them with water and put them on his skin and two days later his bag was still sticking and his skin had healed up it doesn't work for everybody but it, it is very effective if it's going to work it works very well if you keep the skin slightly acidic. So moving on, I thought I'd talk about granulomas because having discussed it um, earlier on in the week, it's, it's a big issue for some people. And this is a charge nurse from one of our hospitals with an ileostomy for Crohn's disease. And he had a small area um, suitable for outpatient treatment. And you can see the stoma is actually there i don't know if you can see the arrow but that's where the stoma is and all that is where he's gradually made the bag aperture bigger and bigger to accommodate these granulomas so essentially we scraped them all off on the local anesthetic cauterized it and put a bag on uh, just around the stoma and the whole thing healed up very nicely occasionally um and it is occasionally but it definitely does happen we have um, people who get very, very painful granulomas around their stomas. And this is an example of a, a young woman with uh, Crohn's disease again. And one way you can tell if it's purely local is you put local anaesthetic in and the pain is completely abolished. 
and so you know it's there's something going on there like a a neuroma an overgrowth of nerve cells or something and so we scraped these off and did it and again the whole thing came back and it was painful so we did it the same thing two weeks apart rather than a month apart which is my clinics are usually monthly and it completely cleared up and we've had hundreds of people with granulomas but we've had about seven or eight people with painful ones that are treated like this so you you, you have to often treat them twice by lo numbing them up with local anesthetic scraping them off and cauterizing the base and you have to do it two weeks again later uh, otherwise they just come straight back again so in the last 18 months to two years we've had 40 cases of um, granulomas like that, which is basically overgranulation. It's effectively a granuloma is um, a colloquial term uh, for an overgrowth of blood vessels. It's a stage of healing which has got stuck effectively. Um, granulomas mean different things to histologists and pathologists, but to most people, it means a, an overgrowth of blood vessels. And they're surprisingly common around stomas, particularly colostomies and ileostomies. And if they're very small, we can treat them with silver nitrate or occasionally liquid nitrogen. And, but most of them we tend to treat with uh, electrocautery. So in other words, we burn them off. And we do that typically um, every year or so. Some people it's every three years and some people it's very much more frequently. And we think they're associated with fecal soiling and irritation. And they tend to be more common in short or irregular stomas, people with hernias who frequently get leaks. And we rarely see them around, around urostomies, but we do occasionally. Around ileostomies, they're often a bit flatter, as you can see in this picture. And in long standing ileostomies, you have to be careful that there's not going to be a change within them, a pre-malignant change. It's very rare, but um, in someone who's had a, an ileostomy for more than 10 years, we tend to review them and biopsy them and send it off for pathology rather than just burning them off. So with silver nitrate, as you can see in this picture, it, it burns, it's a chemical cautery. It's actually quite painful in, in most patients' cases, and it, it, it burns the surface as a chemical burn. Um, but we, I tend to use cautery more. I, I, I say I tend to. I do in York, in, in Manchester, I virtually don't treat them because the nurses do it. And as you can see here, on the top left, that is before removing them and that is after removing them. So that's you know, 10 minutes later. So that's the stoma. And this is the place where they've been burnt off. In this lady's case, which is actually a colostomy, um, we did it in two stages a month apart because there were far too many. It was quite big. So we did the bottom one day and we did the top half a few, a four weeks later. And this is just an example of a, a lady who was very infirm and she was not really suitable for further surgery. She had a very short stoma in a crease, which had been done as an emergency. And so she always had leaks and she had loads of granulomas around her stoma. And she wasn't really able to look after it very well. So we saw her every, every two or three months until she died of old age and cauterized them, burnt them off for her. I say we, the nurses did. Um, in terms of, uh, there's, you'll probably be aware of familial adenomatous polyposis or Gardner's syndrome. Um, this is a, a condition where one gets dysplastic polyps or adenomas in the gut and you get them around stomas occasionally and when, when they do appear they tend to, unlike the normal ones where they look red, they tend to look rather grey and we always send anything that's vaguely grey for pathology just to make sure. It's not very common but it does happen. This is the most uh, spectacular one I've ever seen. This was a chap who came up to see us from Birmingham. And I think this was driven by infection rather than anything else. And uh, I said to my colleague, 
just a chint about that. I'll remove those. And he said, it will take three years off your life if you do that. I'll do it with you. So we did it in surgery. And uh, he basically took the whole thing off and yanked it all together like that. And then when the chap came back for review, he complained about the scar, which I thought was a bit ungrateful. But there you go. And he wanted us to pay for a taxi back to the station for him. So nurse surgery, our dermatology nurses do um, biopsies and other surgery under what's called our prescription. It, effectively, it's governance from the doctor so that they are covered uh, with the nursing council. And we've run masterclasses for stoma nurses for years, and we've got two trained nurses in, in Salford, Zoe and Ben, who've been doing these procedures between them for about 10 years and we've got others being trained on the way and trying to get others trained to do it so i i don't actually do any minor surgery on stomas at all in salford i just have to be there so that it's my responsibility but they do the whole thing and there's zoe again taking some lumps off somebody's uh, stoma so moving on um another condition that uh, I discussed that we thought we'd talk about is a thing called pyoderma gangrenosum. And this is a case from lockdown year. And this is a woman that came to see us. And as you can see, it's recently after surgery, because you can see the holes from the stitches, it broke down. And two days later, it had broke down even, broken down even more. And again, very rapidly. And by the end of the month, it was a big, painful, very tender edged, firm ulcer or hole around the stoma. So what we gave her to treat it was um, uh, on telemedicine advice at the time, because we, we weren't seeing the patients on that particular month or any patients on that particular month, was a thing called tacrolimus, which is an immunosuppressive treatment that's used to stop uh, it, it's used in transplant patients to stop them rejecting kidneys and lungs and what have you when they've been transplanted. And it was applied in aura base, which is a cellulose paste. And within the next month, it started to heal up and almost completely healed up within four or five weeks, which is very good. It, it usually is very responsive. So in, again, in the last 18 months, we've had over 35 patients with pyoderma gangrenosum, which is what that is. And pyoderma gangrenosum is a, a, a relatively unknown quantity, really. Um, I remember when I first started in Salford, uh, we had a surgeon professor, Miles Irving, Sir Miles Irving, and he said, oh, I just inject it with steroid. That doesn't always work. And we tried to um, start new new treatments based on some advice from a couple of very old and experienced dermatologists. And that topical tacrolimus is very helpful for that. So most people clear up with topical treatments, which is usually um, steroid lotions, tacrolimus in paste, steroid tapes. Some people require systemic treatment, which is something like cyclosporin, which is a little bit like tacrolimus, but it's very like tacrolimus. Actually, it works in the same way. And or prednisolone, and the more modern things like adalimumab, or amjavita, you've probably heard of, infliximab, etc. Some people don't really respond very well to treatment. Most people do. Occasionally, we have real problems. So in our patients, the predisposing factors uh, overall, about 50% in the, in the general population, if you have a general population of pyoderma gangrenosum, which is usually on the legs or lower abdomen, uh, about 50% are associated with arthritis, Crohn's, colitis, or blood disorders like leukemias and lymphomas. But obviously in our patients, the vast majority of them have inflammatory bowel disease and a relatively smaller number have rheumatoid arthritis predisposing or the, the hematological problems. And there are just people who just get it. So we have people with no predisposing factors that we can determine, but have got a stoma. So there's something about a stoma which makes it more likely. And what you get is a ragged edged ulcer. And you can see here in this young woman, 
And when it heals up, it heals up in a very scarred manner. And that can stop the bag sticking just because the skin's irregular. So the aim is to treat it as quickly as possible to avoid this sort of thing so that you can get good adhesion. The problems in, in soma patients with PG is large ulcers uh, and the resulting scars, as I've said, stop the bag sticking, causing leaks. And if you get leaks, you get irritation and pyoderma gets worse. It's also extremely painful. And you have to be very careful with topical treatments because if you use anything that's oily or greasy or creamy, the bag won't stick. So there's predisposing factors and there's triggering factors. So you're predisposed to it because you've got a stoma and you've got Crohn's disease, but the things that trigger it off are usually trauma to the skin. So erosions from stripping the skin means that the bag off, traumatic ulcers for the same reason, convex backed appliances are a very common cause of pyoderma gangrenosum and infection. So for example, you get mucocutaneous separation occasionally. Um, soon after surgery where this, the actual stitching that's been done breaks down and we're not really sure why it does but that can develop into pyoderma occasionally and also it turns up in scars and this is just an example of a lady uh, who had a um, blood sampling and she, she actually had a hematological problem and just the injection the needle to take the blood from her arm caused her to get pyoderma gangrenosum. There is um, a, a definite cohort of patients with pyoderma gangrenosum who seem to be driven by, where it seems to be driven by cell, uh, pelvic sepsis. And this is just an example of a, a patient in York who had had about six to nine months of severe pyoderma around his stoma. And one of my colleagues um, removed his rectum sewed him all back up got rid of all the sepsis in the pelvis and within before two days were up it had actually healed up it's by no means universal but it definitely does happen in some cases and it seems to be something to do with the inflammation that drives the condition so just going back to convex appliances if you can avoid them uh, all the better in this condition because um they're far more associated with pyoderma. So 14% of our population used them uh, in about 19, sorry, 2010. Uh, but there was a more than a third of those with pyoderma gangrenosum were using them. So it was much more represented. And people had recurrent pyoderma gangrenosum. It was nearly three quarters of people were using convex appliances. And just as an example, if you can see here, I've lifted this up, which is that bit. This is what's left after it starts to heal up. And the simplest thing to do is to remove these because they cause problems. And so as you can see in this, this another young woman with um, ulcerative colitis, she's got this skin, which is like two different, or one bridge with two different uh, edges to it. And uh, Zoe removed them under local anesthetic got rid of it and the whole thing healed up nicely. As I say, most of the time, topical treatment's effective. We tend not to use intralesional injections of steroid because it can make the ulcers break down again. We've managed, actually we've managed more than that, more than 200 now, and only a proportion of them require um, treatments other than topical treatments. So moving on, uh, hopefully I'm not running over, botulinum toxin or Botox for telescoping stomas. Some stomas, and it's, it's essentially ileostomies and urostomies, sometimes they're fairly small or with a relatively poor spout and they telescope in flush with the skin and then people get leaks, especially at night. Uh, we've used Botox for a long, long time to treat a whole range of things like um, cerebral palsy, spasticity, um, hysterical aphonia, strabismus, which is um, squints. And in dermatology, we use it for sweaty armpits. So it paralyzes what's called cholinergic nerves uh, quite effectively. And uh, occasionally it stops working because people get immune to it because it is actually a protein 
It's the most toxic chemical weight for weight in the entire world. So it doesn't apply to colostomies. It's no point in using it for colostomies because it doesn't work because they don't shrink in so much. Um, it doesn't work for permanently short stomas and it doesn't work for stomas that don't move. So ones that don't shrink in, there's no point in trying it. And this is an example of someone who has a spout, which is approximately two centimeters long normally. And when it shrinks in, it's flush with the skin and she gets leaks. It costs, it used to cost about a hundred pounds. It's gone up quite a lot. Um, and according to uh, studies that have been done over the years, it preferentially affects the longitudinal muscles uh, innovation because of the nature of the transmitters that are used to um, stimulate those muscles to move. And so it, it tends to make the stomas contract in terms of diameter, but stick out more. And what I do is I get 50 units of it and I put roughly a quarter into each of four segments as if it was a, a slice of cake by injecting it where I expect the muscle to be. <clears throat> Obviously, I don't know exactly where the muscle is because the stoma is inverted. So when you're looking at a stoma, you're looking at it turned inside out. So you've got to sort of guess, but it almost always works. So here's just an example of a urostomy patient. And that arrow there is showing you that the opening for her stoma comes straight onto the skin so a bag comes off and afterwards it comes straight out. So that's a relatively short ileos uh, urostomy, but it works very well for that. I've not come across any side effects at all using Botox and we've, we've uh, it, when I initially did it, it worked really well in most patients. It, it's, we've treated about 25 people with it so far and it works exceptionally well. We, we haven't got funding for it in Salford because the local authorities won't fund it at all but we do in york so the people who get it in in the west of the northwest tend to have to pay for it whereas in york they get it for nothing and if they live somewhere in between they tend to come to york in the initial seven patients it was four ileostomies and two of them have required treatment every six months but what tends to happen is you treat them three or four times and they don't need it anymore because the stoma seems to settle down and doesn't require further treatment. And the most important thing is that the number of bag changes per week drop from about 19 on average to about three required. So they, do, they get far fewer leaks. So they actually save money and it's highly cost effective. They save around about... Um, £2,500 a year per patient um, for the NHS. So why they, they won't fund it in various places is beyond me because it's very straightforward. So teledermatology, moving on. Um, York Dermatology Department has the largest telemedicine service in the UK, and that's any speciality. So we, we actually see and advise on more patients in, in dermatology in York um, than any other speciality in any other hospital in the country. And my colleague who has sort of done the most of this has uh, been receiving accolades from NHS England for this. Advice requests for stomas are rather more modest. And these are from local and regional stoma nurses and doctors. They're national um, doctors and nurses. And requests we get direct from patients or their carers. We get quite a number of these who want to see me privately. And obviously, because it's a, a specialist um, thing, I tend not to see anybody privately for stomas because it's a joint effort between me and the nurses. So it's, it's much more important to uh, actually have the, 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 the multidisciplinary team. But still, we get a lot of requests. So we get them by text, by email, by telephone, and occasionally paper, much less than it used to be. <clears throat> we get approximately 100 per year over the last three years. And most non-paper requests include at least one photograph, either on the, the text or the email. And what's useful about it is 
for people who live a long way away from where I work, either the northwest or the northeast, um, we can treat and follow them up um, remotely, effectively, by photographs and emails on, and mainly telephone calls, to be honest. So it's quite useful. And just as an example, and I've had questions about the legality of all this, but this is a young woman from Salford who um, was finally had a completion proctectomy, but prior to that, she was constantly sending me pictures how she'd responded to topical tacrolimus uh, to show me that it healed up very nicely. Um, and um, that was my very first ever text picture. And I can't remember when it was, but it was about 10 years ago. And that's, that happens all the time now. So uh, hopefully I'm not, I can't see the time on my computer, but hopefully I'm not running over. But uh, very, a couple of common, uh, non, um, not specifically um, Crohn's and colitis related things. This is a man uh, with an ileostomy for um, large bowel cancer. And he'd not previously had any skin problems. And as you can see, he'd had this rash since leaving hospital and it wasn't where the adhesive barrier of his stoma bag was, but it was where the bag actually sat. And it wasn't in that crease that you can see there. So you have to think about why he might have had it. And this was a lady with a very similar history with a colostomy. And she also had a rash around her neck. but not immediately around her stoma, but elsewhere. And what they were both doing was putting um, deodorizing perf perfume drops into the, um, the stoma bag to try and prevent smells, which is obviously a, a big problem of concern for a lot of people. And this contains, these contain a chemical which is found in lemons and what have you, called limonene. And if you squirt this stuff into a stoma bag, and smell the outside of the bag, you can smell it coming through within about two minutes. It penetrates polythene really quickly and it's quite allergenic in some people. And so they were allergic to limonene and um, when they stopped doing it, the rash completely cleared up. And it was a nurse that spotted that by the way, it wasn't me. Um, so one thing that we, we tend to do patch testing or cutaneous allergy testing, um, Effectively, it's quite uncommon around stomas. And the most useful thing to do is called a usage test, where you put a bag that you suspect is causing problems on a normal piece of skin, a non-stoma piece of skin, like your side or your arm or somewhere, and leave it on for five to eight days and see if it produces a reaction. And if it does, then you're probably allergic to something that's within that, as this woman was. She was allergic to an acrylate adhesive, like a super glue type adhesive that they use on the, the tape border. And this is another one, that's the tape border and the whole, th the whole thing was uh, fabric with acrylic adhesive and she's reacted to the whole thing. So five days isn't enough, it, used, it needs to be a week usually. So it's relatively uncommon most of the things that we found to cause problems were fragrances and preservatives and creams, but occasionally it's due to the adhesives. So last, lastly, uh, or second from last, this is uh, a lady with a, a non-itchy but sore rash. And what she's got is psoriasis. And psoriasis is about twice as common in Crohn's and colitis than in, 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 the con in patients with Crohn's and colitis compared to people who don't have Crohn's or colitis. And it's a very common rash, presents with big, thick red and scaly plaques on the elbows and knees, the scalp, uh, it, it, particularly like scars and areas of trauma like tattoos, but it can occur anywhere and occasionally it's flexural. In other words, you can get up the crack in the bottom armpits, under the breast, etc. And it's very problematic. And it appears in damaged skin. So if you damage the skin, 
say you have a, a severe scratch on the thigh and you've got psoriasis, there's a 50-50 chance that you'll get psoriasis within the scratch. So it does occur around stomas like this short, this is actually an ileostomy in a, a patient who was a, a nurse on um, the uh, award in Salford called H8, it was called, I think it still is. So just an example, the most important thing, and this is what I normally would tell the stoma nurses, is always think of the whole patient. So you can look at the rash around the stoma and you think, well, I'm not really sure what that is. But if you look at the rest of her, she's got a scaly scalp. She's got quite significant psoriasis and she had it in the umbilicus, the belly button, and she had it on the elbows and knees. So you have to think of the whole picture. And it, because of the nature of where it is, um, you can't use the, you can't use light treatment very easily, although you can, and you can't easily justify systemic treatment, tablets and injections and things like adalimumab. Um, but topical steroids, um, which we tend not to use generally, are highly effective usually. And this is an example of someone with it behind the ear, on the knee and around the stoma. And the reason this is relevant is it's cleared up very nicely. It's still red around the stoma, but the bag will stick because it's no longer flaky. So it doesn't matter what it looks like so long as the adhesion of the pouch is satisfactory. And the other thing is in about half the patients, if they use a thick dressing, like a thick hydrocolloid rather than just a tape barrier, you can see here, this is a, a patient with psoriasis who's got psoriasis everywhere except underneath the thick toffee colored hydrocolloid of her bag and here you can see she's not got it around the the central portion which is thick hydrocolloid she's got very minor psoriasis where the tape border of the bag is and ordinary psoriasis outside it so it does respond well to being occluded and it's often around the belly button and very lastly um one of the things which isn't often talked about but does definitely occur is dermatoses or skin problems caused by the patient or stoma problems caused by the patient. In this case it was a chap who liked gin and he fell on the floor one night in his bathroom and found it was really nice to sleep with his head on the uh, the bath mat but he folded his stoma over and it was all necrotic the next morning but the nature of stomas is they're very vascular. They've got a very good blood supply and they heal up very quickly. So he was okay. Occasionally you get people who deliberately damage the stoma. And this was a lady who'd previously done things like stuck biro uh, caps up the stoma. And in this case, she was burning it with boiling water. And so there's, it's very important to get a good history from people because there are definite anxiety or, or frankly um, obsessive self-harm behaviors in a very small number of people but it definitely does happen and it's very important to uh, be aware of it and then there's obviously um, the concerns about leaks etc and uh, smells and what have you and this is a lady who was sent to us because the nurse thought she had um, pyoderma gangrenosum which is this non non specific or, or non or un, misunderstood ulcerative condition but that was actually a traumatic ulcer from pressure and she was wearing a belt so tight she'd actually caused necrosis of the skin over the back of her pelvic bones here yeah, she was wearing it so tight and it took um two of our stoma nurses about six months to gradually talk her into getting it looser and looser and explaining or helping her to get to grips with the fact that she could um, she could get away without wearing it so tight and uh, it worked and she was very very grateful so hopefully that's not gone on too long because I can't tell the time um, and that's the end so any questions thank you very much Callum that was a, a great overview of Peru. I guess what you call peristomal dermatology. Yeah. Um, we're probably not going to have time for questions right now because the workshops that we've got lined up are all about to start. But I'm hoping you'll come back and join us uh, at 4.30.
yes uh, when we'll have a speaker panel and take questions then i will so so thanks again callum uh, it, it's been a great pleasure to to welcome you and to give the brown brook lecture um i think um the brown brook medal is on its way to you um although we don't actually have it to present to you and obviously even if we did we wouldn't be able to give it you in person uh, today because of the way the meeting's been organized but but thank you very much once again for a great lecture um I'm now going to direct uh, everybody back to the workshops, uh, the same instructions um, as you had this morning. Um, again, um, please be aware that the first workshop, the uh, Back to Better Working, is not available, but the other three are. Uh, so please enjoy those. Then there'll be a coffee break and we will all reconvene at 4pm when Zara Perry Woodford um, will give us a talk about uh, the evolution of stoma nursing services. Thank you. Okay, it's four o'clock. Um, we've got quite a lot still to get through. Um, and I wanna make sure we have time for a good speaker panel. So I think we should start again. And it's my pleasure to welcome Zara Perry Woodford to give the last talk of today, the last formal talk of today. Um, Zora will actually need a very, lit very little introduction to, to most of you here. Um, she's been a nurse for over 25 years, 20 of which have been spent in the field of colorectal nursing and stoma care. Um, and for much of that time, she's been working with uh, my friends and colleagues at, at St. Mark's Hospital. She runs nurse-led clinics, a telephone and email advice line, she became a consultant nurse in 2018 and is now head of a department of 12 nurses. She's published widely in nursing and medical journals. She's presented at national and international conferences, and she's recently spent some time with the NHS supply chain, uh, working on a project aimed at identifying factors which would improve efficiencies and processes within stoma care. So it's my great pleasure to, to welcome Zara to come and tell us about evolving stoma nursing services. Zara, please. Zara, you Sorry, may... I just worked that out, thank you. Um, thank you, Prof, for that great introduction and thank you to everybody of the IAA committee for having the pouch team here today. Um, there is still so much learning to do, so um, I shall crack on, let's just see if I can share my screen. Hopefully everybody's got a view of this. So, slideshow. I've been asked to speak today about the evolving stoma care nursing services. And I think we've had some brilliant talks. It doesn't matter how long you've been a nurse, you can always learn something. So I think stoma care nursing has really changed and what we want to look at is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic to stoma nursing services. I don't think you can do a conference or a talk without mentioning the pandemic these days. Look at the way we mitigated some of the risks to our service and now we're in our recovery phase, how we sort of move forward to a new normal. Um, one of the things we did start was a prescription management service. And again, I want just like to present some of the outcomes of a pilot that we did, which is sort of a new thing in Northwest London. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been huge. There was a general sense of uncertainty, fear of the unknown, but also mixed with enthusiasm because we were going to beat this pandemic. However, very soon we realized that there was a shortage of the workforce because we were either shielding or simply reduced or redeployed to other wards. Fear of being on other wards, a lot of our stoma nurses hadn't been on a ward for over 10 odd years on a drop round. A lot of us faced difficulties not actually seeing our patients in face-to-face -face clinics and patients felt the same, not being able to access stoma nurses or even their GP. Acute trust did not have the digital technology which we have 
two years later and for older nurses as well, especially myself, really struggled with the speed of digital technology, the changes and also the training needed to keep up with all the new systems. Some patients were forced to self-care, which was very difficult, just bumble along um, because they knew we were really busy or they couldn't access us. And very few patients actually started to stockpile because they were worried because there was quite a lot of hype about certain products not being available. But luckily, I'm hoping that didn't affect too many people. One thing that was for sure was that elective surgery was cancelled. So anxiety and worry was quite high, not only for patients, but also for the medical staff who realised that lists were just getting longer and longer. And for patients and their family, especially our new stoma patients, those that did have their operations, they had an inability to access their families as there were no visitors allowed in the hospital. And there was that psychological support that was completely lost for our patients. We also found it very difficult. Processes and pathways and information kept changing. We found it very difficult to update our patients or update our staff. And then in the midst of all of this, St. Mark's moved hospital site. The benefit was so that we could keep operating as Northwick Park was the major receiving site for COVID positive patients in London. So we had to move in order to keep doing operating. Um, that's really quickly escalated to low morale, burnout and frustration for a lot of, of stoma nurses. One thing that is certain is that this pandemic has stretched healthcare systems beyond capacity, but there are also opportunities. One of the biggest things is to be able to identify and bridge these gaps in our service delivery, as well as mitigating the risks and challenges, but also to improve patient experience. I think one of the biggest um, inputs that the NHS has provided is the technology and the training for people to actually change culture, learn new skills and now run more cost effective services. So how did we mitigate some of these risks? So the first thing was a complete workforce reconfiguration. Instead of all of us being on the COVID wards, we rotated just to get a bit of work-life balance. As I said, at first, there's quite a lot of enthusiasm, but again, managing COVID positive patients with a stoma or fistula was very difficult behind um, full PPE. Um, a lot of us were getting tired, dehydrated, headaches, and we were trying to take on all our advice we give our patients about dehydration. But again, we were really beginning to struggle. So some of us spent time just doing office work while others went onto the COVID ward. Some of us worked reduced hours. So again, we worked at home. Now this is a model which we are still trying to um, implement. However, there are quite a few critics of the working at home model, especially for nurses. Um, however, I'm quite pleased to say we have really set up working from home, which I will explain a little bit later. And it has been quite positive. Um, we have tried to digitalize everything and sort of almost um, change the way that we work. This was really important in the way that we handed over patients. Because again, there was lots of screening of patients, a lot of information and moving around. Having a digital handover sheet was the best thing that we did. And I know a lot of services already use digital handovers, but it was very good because again, by working from home, you can access patients and follow patients around. We've always had telephone and clinic services, but again, these were paramount to keeping our services running and manned. We were able to update the information on the website. You can see from Raleigh's talk earlier, we've put a lot of work into making sure our website had information and also um, for patients and medical staff who were looking after stoma or pouch patients and needing some extra advice. Funny enough, we actually had a bit more time to do stuff which we hadn't done before. And I think it was just really because it was necessary that we had clear pathways, clear protocols and guidelines. And um, especially as a nurse consultant, 
it gave me a bit of protected time, believe it or not, to get some of these protocols sorted out because it was important to the trust and the NHS as a whole. Um, we also produced a stoma book, which Raleigh showed you earlier. And this again has been a really good guide for all our patients, not only those with an ileostomy, but those with a colostomy or urostomy, based on the theory of the pouch book, which just takes people through the journey of having a stoma. And again, this sort of helped, maybe just made us feel less guilty for not spending as much time with our patients, but at least making sure they had a resource. We also produced a lot of information sheets. We had quite a few of these, but we made sure they were all electronic so we could share them easily and move them onto our website. For the pouch service in particular, you know, we're hoping to get a few more done in stoma care, is we've got over 75 flashcards, as I said, we can email them just to the patients if they need to and healthcare professionals. They're also a resource for the stoma team because sometimes when the stoma team cover the pouch service, it can be quite difficult. So we have general information about pouches, diagrams, um, diet, hydration, complication management, even things on how to do certain tests or book examinations or investigations. Um, we have common ones which we can share with patients, which are usually one sheet of A4 paper on perianal skin care, um, evacuation difficulties and effective emptying techniques. A lot of the information we gave patients during this period was quite rushed. So this was almost sort of like a backup if you didn't feel the patient may have understood fully. Um, we also invested in virtual technology. And I think this has been, as I said, one of the great advantages of um, COVID pandemic, if there ever has been. Um, this is Rally with one of our stoma patients using an iPad, which we had tried for years to obtain, but we were able to get an iPad and that's Rally teaching our patient with her husband or sorry, her relative to make sure that she knew exactly what was happening with her stoma care when she went home because she was not allowed to have any visitors. We were also able to record care plans. So step-by-step -step care plans for people with stomas or may have had a wound or needed more complex treatment. And again, just offering that psychological support. Most patients were just so relieved to have their relative join them, even if it was online. And again, we've taken this a step forward to the wards we have now got very used to these little icons. At first, they were all a little bit overwhelming, but they're now just commonplace. We use, um, we started using a platform called Attend Anywhere. And again, it was a bit of a learning curve for our team, but we are now able to review patients in virtual clinics. And it's been amazing. Most people who have a smartphone or access to a computer, we've been able to um, send text messages, reminder messages to patients, reminders, virtual appointments are coming in the next couple of days. So the rate of people not attending clinics has been much lower. We've also been able to communicate um, hugely with all our MDT. So where it would be very difficult to get three or four healthcare professionals together, we're now able on MS Teams to talk to our colleagues in groups of 20 or 30 people. And again, platforms like Zoom have become um, apparently the way forward for webinars, support group meetings and information days like this, which we could have probably never have pulled together this soon after COVID. And that leads me on to what we also started looking at was prescription management service and electronic prescribing to make sure that prescriptions for patients were managed better and that patients received a service that was what was expected of um, a stoma care team on discharge. So what is a prescription management service? Well, it was first described in Nottinghamshire in 2016 
Um, that was an appliance management service, NAMS, and it's a novel way of clinical commissioning groups or CCGs managing the prescriptions and long-term long -term care of people with a stoma. So all stoma prescriptions and changes to those prescriptions are reviewed and managed by experienced stoma care nurses. They may be the stoma nurses that you know in a prescription management hub, or they may be paid and work for the prescription management service. However, they are the ones that will be checking the prescriptions and making sure that you are okay with the bag and the amount of product that you are receiving. They are also supported by trained administrators instead of the GP, prescription clerks, or practiced pharmacists who may not always know exactly what products you are using and in what quantities you require them. So why were they introduced? So in the UK, there is an estimated 205,000 people with a stoma, and that generates about a 360 million pound annual spend. Um, and as Prof mentioned, I have done some work with procurement and NHS England is really looking at the spend. And I think the difficulty we have had as stoma nurses and GPs is that we don't have a stoma patient database. Therefore, most GPs and stoma nurses do not know how many stoma patients they actually look after. They therefore do not know what their spend is. So they cannot justify if the spend is high or actually being managed really well. But by being able to manage the products and the spend, we can improve the patient experience and improve the quality of the nursing services that we offer. We can also stop waste because by generating a huge amount of waste, which um, a lot of stoma nurses and, and industry do not um, let waste in the UK and are actually able to send them to developing countries or other countries in need of these products, the bill still lies with the NHS. We can't afford to have too much waste, but we want to make these savings without restricting patient choice or products. And that's why it's very important that prescription management services are managed mainly by NHS or nurses who are um, managing this, the, this patient group. And these are common scenes in, in stoma nurse departments. These are just returned products. And once these products have been prescribed and dispensed, unfortunately, we are unable to use them again. So it's a huge amount of wastage. That costs about 1400 um, street value. And these boxes and um, black sacks are ranging anywhere just over 600 pounds. So it's a huge amount of money that we, we, we could save and, and keep investing in stoma care services. So what does the HAPS, HAPS being our HARO appliance prescription service look like? So basically patients are discharged from our hospital, St. Mark Central Middlesex or Ealing, and then referred straight to the Connect services who manage our prescriptions um, and dispensing rather than the GP. If the patient is new to our local areas or a GP practice with an old established stoma that they haven't been reviewed or even had surgery at another hospital but live in our areas, we will review the patient and then put them onto the Connect um, services, which is HATS. And if not, these areas refer directly to us so we can review the patient and their prescription first. In order to make this work, we looked at 11 um, Harrow GP practices in our pilot and found 48 established stoma patients. Um, the prescribing and dispensing, as I said, has been done by Connect. So that service is linked to Fittleworth, which many of our patients knew as their DAC or dispensing appliance contractor. But all the clinical input, so before prescriptions were changed or adjusted, the stoma nurses at St. Mark's Hospital were able to offer advice if needed. Um, however, during the pandemic, we were worried that new stoma patients may not be able to get to their GP and Connect limit 
Connect Services actually allowed us to add all our patients from the new patients from Harrow, Brent and Ealing CCGs to make sure that they had a robust service when they left hospital. It is quite a long pathway and that's the Connect service, but you can actually see that some patients on the pathway with a prescription hub are offered annual clinical reviews to make sure that they are always reviewed clinically to make sure the prescription is correct. So in a nutshell, the Stoman Airsat HAPS writes your prescription after advice from us and does a clinical review or a small clinical review. If you have no problems, HAP sends your prescription electronically now, which is another um, new technology we've started, um, straight to your delivery company or your pharmacy, and then that gets delivered or you collect your bags from your pharmacy. So it's really quite a simple process. If at any time, there is a problem at the, the time of your prescription or repeat prescription, the stoma nurses review you and your products. From, this, from the pilot, we managed to save 5,000 pounds. Our pilot lasted um, six months longer than we wanted it to. The unfortunate problem we had was we started it in January, 2020, which was the beginning of the pandemic. Um, by the end, we had 37 patients after 10 months, and that was because quite a few patients either had their stomas reversed or a couple patients were not actually in our area, but they had our GPs um, allocated to them. Um, average every um, of those 37 patients, every script, we had a, a reduction of approximately 5%. And again, I really need to um, make it clear that patients aren't just taken off of products that they need. Our patients were reviewed and if they did need their products, um, the aim of this was not to get rid of, of necessary products. Um, £5,000 in CCG land is not a, a, a drop in the ocean really um, compared to what savings they expect, but I, I still strongly believe every little helps and this is a way forward. Um, Harrow overall is growing, the spend is growing at 4.2%, which is, which is a little bit actually below average spend nationally. And again, we have seen that patients, there is a reduction in touch points such as GP appointments, a &E attendance. So it is really quite hard to monitor if patients were actually going to go to their GPs or attend a &E because we've already um, prevented that occurrence. By the um, team at HAPS, the nurses and um, the, the prescriptions being managed by the HAPS team, that reduced GP call handling in the fact that they didn't have to address these concerns by approximately eight hours, giving the GPs a lot more time to do other work which necessarily uh, had to be done. Um, and because this pilot was sponsored by our um, company that sponsors the Stillman team being Dan Zach Hollister, there were no costs for the CCG. We have about 284 patients on this um, pilot. We're still calling it a pilot because unfortunately, though we, we've um, got as far as presenting this as a good case, and we've got quite a lot of evidence out of different areas in the country using prescription management services. Unfortunately, with the new um, ICS, which is our um, integrated care service, um, we, we have in Northwest London, a lot of the decisions are on hold. So hopefully we can drive this forward in the next months. The, the good news is that if we can show that we're reducing the annual growth, hopefully this will be um, something that is of interest to not only the CCG, but will improve our patients. So we made some savings, as I said, there were no delays that we were aware of in Stoneman prescription or deliveries. Any clinical concerns were triaged and escalated to the Stoma care team where we could see our patients. And because we had virtual technology, we were able to see our patients much quickly, especially as they couldn't come to clinics and we couldn't get out to see them. 
patients were reassured and reported mainly positive experiences. Um, HAPS also has the technology to monitor their calls and each patient is asked to do a survey following their interaction with the telephone um, service. And most people, 96.5%, were very or extremely satisfied with the outcome of their call and about 93% were um, satisfied to the level of outstanding um, about the person that took their call being able to help them. So as I've explained, there's quite a few benefits of prescription management services. Um, it's taken quite a lot of work to make sure that um, our nurses and our uh, connect management all work together. It really does help with acute nurses in the hospital, like a lot of our St. Mark's team, to, to link with our home care providers, our community nurses, district nurses, anybody who has contact with our stoma patients that might have problems with prescriptions. Again, looking at the amount of time that GPs can save by um, not having to review stoma prescriptions and really making sure that the right intervention is done by the right people, mainly the stoma nurses, at the right time and in the right place. We can make sure that there is an effective use of NHS time and resource. One of the other things is we've been able to identify a, a lot of our lost ostomists. So those are people that have probably been in the community for five, 10 years or even longer without the benefit of um, seeing a stoma nurse. From a governance point of view, um, Connect Services is CQC registered and um, that puts a bit of encouragement to use services like this. There have been some barriers besides the pandemic. Um, GPs and practices didn't really buy in immediately. There was a lot of questioning. Um, there's always a question if you want to implement something that um, takes away from the GP and may have a smaller cost. There was quite a lot of problems looking for our stoma patients on huge databases and running searches and actually cleansing the data because a lot of patients were under bowel continence streams which included wound patients or patients with um, continence issues and, and they didn't actually have a stoma at all. The availability of clinic space is still very sparse in London as well as being able to set up um, suitable clinics. Patients are always going to be a little bit wary of change especially implementing um, services that may potentially affect their um, supply of stoma products. And again, sometimes though GPs had agreed to HAPS, they were still um, repeating prescriptions. So sometimes patients were getting very conflicting information coming from HAPS and also their GPs. So in conclusion, workforce shortages, low morale, funding pressures, and the configuration of NHS services in, are not new. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased these pressures exponentially. However, we have mitigated some of the risks to stoma nursing services and strive to continue to recover and improve current services and patient experience. Um, thank you very much. And I just want to thank my pouch nurses, Petia and Riley, who have joined on today. Um, I, I wanted to um, thank them, especially for some of the diagrams. They, they didn't mention that they drew most of these and I don't know where I would be without them. Um, Rally has only done um, one national presentation and this is it. And I just wanted to say how very proud I am of the, the entire team at St. Mark's and um, the way we've been able to change the way that we work despite everything that's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zara. Thanks for a, a great presentation. And thanks also for keeping to time, which means we should hopefully have plenty of time to field some questions. 
Um, I'm going to ask um, all of you who spoke today to turn your camera on so that um, our members can see us. Um, so that um, as far as I can see is Sophie and Sarah and Colin uh, and Raleigh and Zara still got her camera on. Um, and hopefully um, there will be some uh, questions. I think that we've already been trying to keep up with them as far as we've been able to during the meetings. I know um, my, my uh, colleague Neil Sharp has um, addressed some of the questions um, which came up in relation to parastomal hernias, which I hope uh, was helpful. Um, I'm not sure if there are any additional questions. Um, I would emphasize once again that we can't answer specific questions about specific healthcare issues, but we are happy to address any generic issues relating to um, ileostomy care. Um, can we um, also make sure that if there are any um, specific questions aimed at uh, the workshop facilitators, they're able to do that as well. And I also want to take the opportunity, in fact, while I can and before I forget, to thank Carol Cate on all, all our behalves for the huge amount of work she's done in, in organising this. Um, so there's one question that I can see, um, and that relates to Lu Lucy Lewis, who's asked, um, whether there are any resources for weight loss specifically with an ileostomy. I'm happy to take that, Gordon, if that's helpful. Yes, please. So um, there are some specific resources on healthy eating with a stoma, but one of the things that we really find is that for most of the time, and I've spoken about this before, I'm just trying to think about places I could signpost to about things that I've, I've written and, and worked on before around this, but ultimately, usually, it's not that you need me to tell you that you need to eat less and move more and that cake is worse than fruit and things like that. It's just that it's quite difficult to make those changes. And living with a stoma often makes it even more difficult to make those changes, particularly if you're trying to manage the output from your bag. So there are some generic resources on weight management with a stoma. But if that is something that you are struggling with, particularly Lucy, and you feel that you might need some emotional support around uh, emotional eating and that kind of thing, then I'd really recommend that you ask your GP to refer you to a dietitian, or you can come and see one of us in private practice if you have the resources, because ultimately it is about tailored and specialist advice that can really get you on the right track if you've tried all of the things already in the generic advice that is available online. And I'll ask Carol to dig out anything that we do have on that and signpost you to it after the event, if that's okay. Any other generic questions that we can address? So I think this is, this is a question possibly for me, um, uh, possibly several for me. Bearing in mind litigation is costing NHS almost two thirds of the annual budget. I wonder whether this figure is increasing or decreasing. Um, the answer is it has been increasing year on year. Um, whether or not there will be a further increase or a decrease as a consequence of COVID um, remains to be seen. I suspect the figure will be quite complex. Um, and indeed, I think COVID itself is going to throw up some very interesting medico legal issues because there's no doubt that we are, um, we've been hampered significantly in providing what we would normally regard as timely treatment for a large number of people as a result of the COVID pandemic. The problem is, I think it would be very difficult for a court to conclude that an individual health provider failed uh, in their duty of care as a result of um, the inability to provide timely treatment when nobody in the country was able to provide timely treatment because we were all swamped um, with the consequences of the pandemic. I think um, one has to bear in mind that uh, I'm not a politician by any means, but there's no doubt that there is a complex interplay between politics and the courts in issues like this. And I suspect if a court um, concluded that there was a breach of duty because somebody, for example, didn't get a timely operation and a timely planned operation, when there was actually no facilities to do it anywhere in the country, it would open some very difficult questions up um, that nobody really could answer. So I suspect that's not going to happen. Um, another question um, that was asked about consent 
Is there a need for us to see consent as a process? Yes, it is already seen as a process. If you go back through some of the slides that I put up, it's very clear both to from the um, point of view of the process itself and the General Medical Council's view and indeed the court's view of consent. Consent is not a discussion and signing a form. It is a complex and ongoing process where a doctor or doctors and a patient have a series of discussions, um, often over a period of time, um, which allows a patient to make an informed choice about the treatment they want. So it is not something which happens at one point in time. Um, copy, uh, so um, Anita Savage wants to know if she can get a copy of the Stoma Care book. So I think that's a question for Raleigh and colleagues. Yes, uh, I think well, my colleague Peter has just put the link to our website so you can access more information there. There is all the details how to obtain the book. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, question in Sophie's session. Are probiotics any good? They claim they are clinically proven and manufactured for most major retailers. Sophie, um, do you have a view about the value of probiotics? I know I do, I do but let's I see do. what you say first. <laughs> I certainly do. And I can see that we've got a question about Activia as well. Apologies mm -hmm. if you can hear my puppy rustling around in the background. He's been desperate to make a cameo all day. Um, yeah, so probiotics and certainly the claims that you might see on the packets of probiotics certainly won't apply to anyone living without a colon. So we can't guarantee anything when you live without a colon. Those claims and the health claims that we see there are barely, you know, stand up to much stigma, um, much uh, investigation, even if you do live with a colon. So I certainly would be cautious about spending money on them before you've done all of the other things that I mentioned in my talk earlier. If you want to try Activia or some of the other food based drinks, they contain some beneficial bacteria that again might benefit your oral microbiome if you if they don't have any gut health benefits. But ultimately, they should be the very last thing that you spend money on. They should be the cherry on the cake of your gut health sort of uh, care plan, as opposed to something that you focus on and spend a lot of money on to start with, because we really are in the infancy of understanding their benefits. And none of the research has been done on people without colons to date. Can I also pick up on that as someone who's actually been involved in some research about the gut barrier? and the gut microbiome. I think one of the big dilemmas that we have scientifically in this scenario is looking at cause and effect. So there's an assumption that because you have symptoms or even a disease and that disease is associated or those symptoms are associated with a change in your gut microbiome, the gut microbiome is actually the cause of the illness or the cause of the symptoms. And there's actually extremely poor evidence. In fact, there's virtually no evidence in humans um, that that is actually the case. Um, so I think you have to be very careful to extrapolate from finding, for example, that there is in patients with pouchitis, for example, a reduced variability of the uh, microbiome. In other words, the total number of bacteria may be the same, but there is a, a, a reduction in the, the variability of those bacteria, that that is actually the cause of pouchitis. It could very well be that that is actually the consequence of something else, which is driving the pouchitis. What is getting really uh, very interesting though, is that there are some animal studies which are beginning to show that you can, certainly in some animals, you can manipulate the bio with really quite staggering effects. So um, there is a strain of mice which are genetically obese. And what we've been able to show is if you take the gut flora out of those mice and you put it in to mice which are not obese, those mice become obese, suggesting that there's a very complex interaction between diet and food absorption and obesity, which may actually be at least in some part related to the bacteria you have in your gut. So as Sophie said, this is a really exciting area in which we're beginning to understand that there's the, the, the buzzword actually is crosstalk between your gut bacteria and your gut and other parts of your body, including as you've heard your brain, uh, which determine all sorts of things, including behavior. Um, and I suspect it may well take 20, 30, 40, 50 years 
um, before we unravel lots of that and lots of that actually turns out um, to be relevant to treatments that we may be able to offer. Um, so that's that. Um, Samantha wants to know, is it time for a UK-wide database of stoma patients? So that's a question I think for Zara. What do you think, Zara? Um, that's what we are in the process of trying to do. It's a very difficult job. Um, and it was something that I was looking at when I was on my secondment with um, London procurement and collaborative procurement. But I really think that it's the responsibility now of stoma nurses to at least start trying to uh, monitor all their new patients and try and find our lost ostomates. I know at St. Mark's we've got a database with a lot of our patients now um, and it's just trying to keep these records but I'm very aware you might need investment into administration support to help get this data. Can I, can I also point out that this is a really contentious area. Mm -hmm. um, the NHS and indeed um, the government have a very poor track record of being able to protect confidentiality in issues like this. If you think about the number of times there have been data leaks um, where data that have been held centrally have been found on train seats or been released accidentally online. Um, one of the things that's going to cause, I think, a huge amount of anxiety is uh, the release of a database of several tens of thousands of names of every patient who may at some point or currently have a stoma. So I, I think um, although there are huge benefits potentially to be had in both commissioning terms and procurement terms and research terms from being able to identify a group of patients who have stomas, there are also massive risks in terms of confidentiality that have to be uh, negotiated and safeguarded. And um, I, for one, would be really quite anxious about um, the previous track record of us being able to do that. Um, next question, um, I guess one for me, do we need to change the language about consent? Has patient X been consented? Um, I, th I think you have to be, that's a question to brought from Brian Devlin. I think doctors and nurses uh, are, for understandable reasons, uh, very keen to use shorthand when they describe a process of consent, which can often um, go on for weeks and weeks and weeks and may be very intricate. Um, so I don't, I don't think that language will change. What I think may change and has changed is what it actually describes. In other words, I think everybody involved in taking consent from patients for anything actually now realizes it's not just a please sign here and we'll do whatever it is we decide that you should have. It's now the result of detailed uh, two-way discussion, at least two-way discussion between doctors and their patients. And of course that doesn't mean you shouldn't then say is Mr. Smith consented? Well, yes he has, but that may well be the representation of several weeks of discussion. Um, Linda Tutty wants to know why some pouches stop working after 10 to 15 years. Is it common and are there any reasons for that? Raleigh, what do you think? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it is just like every part of our body. The more we age, things start to work less. If you imagine with time, with aging, we would need glasses. Now your knees might start to hurt, so you might need knee replacement. So just like every part of your body, the pouch itself, the more you age, the more it would start to have problems that initially you would have not had. So yes, it is common with time, things do not work as great. Well, what I do think I, I, I see, certainly in some of my pouch patients after many years, is they get a dilated pouch. Um, and whether that's the consequence of many years of perhaps incomplete pouch emptying and they have a little bit of what we call anismus, so they don't relax their bottom muscles properly. Um, I don't know, but there's, there's definitely a cohort of patients who, who um, seem to get very dilated pouches and they often struggle with pouch emptying. But I think that the main thing I would say in my experience compared to patients with large bowel disease who have impaired large bowel emptying is they don't seem to suffer greatly as a consequence of it. They don't, they don't seem to have um, significant illness associated with impaired evacuation. Um, they don't in general spend hours and hours and hours and hours on the toilet 
because their pouches don't empty properly. And I personally can't think of a single patient I've had in the last 25, 30 years in whom I've had to remove a pouch simply because of impaired pouch emptying. And I don't know whether Raleigh or Zara, you, you have an experience of that at St. Mark's? Well, again, uh, pouch emptying difficulties, if we, there is a problem, we will also discuss different techniques to help and see what might be the problem. So many times we might be able to advise or give aids to help emptying the pouch. So it wouldn't necessarily call for removing the pouch or going for a stomach just because of emptying difficulties. So first we're going to see what else we can offer. And I think we strongly, because we do have the resource a lot of hospitals don't have at St. Mark's, we do look at preventing, as you say, some of the problems with long-term evacuation difficulty so we do try to get patients seen or techniques such as irrigation or other evacuation techniques as Riley said pretty early yeah okay thank you um question for Sophie again I've got my own views but I'd be interested to hear what Sophie says Activia gut health yeah so Activia? again uh, similarly with any other probiotic products, no great benefit that we can say for sure when you don't live with a colon, their targeted sort of therapeutic uh, benefits, if you like, would be for the colon and you don't have one, presumably if you're on this chat, that doesn't mean necessarily that you may not, that you wouldn't get any pouch benefits or that you may not have any other benefits. And remember, we do have this oral microbiome and an upper respiratory tract microbiome, and you may well get some benefits from the bacteria that are there but there's no guarantee. So it's something to take a view on. If you enjoy it and you feel that it's something you want to have in your diet, then great, but it's not going to necessarily have any magical benefits that you, you may hope for. Can, can I push you a little bit, Sophie? Then? Sure. Let's, let's just forget for a moment that we're dealing with a population of um, individuals who don't have a large bowel. Do you have any thoughts about, and I'm not gonna specify the product because there are a number of yogurt related products on the market. Do you have any thought about the value of any of those products in patients who do have a large bowel? Yeah, so we do have some data that though some of those fermented products, particularly the fermented milk products, may well uh, allow some of the beneficial bacteria to reach the colon alive. And there is some further limited data to suggest that then, that then does have a positive impact on the microbiome. So it does have an impact on the quality and quantity of bacteria, good bacteria within the colon. We think one of the reasons that milk-based products work well as probiotic um, drinks and that you have in you, that you, you swallow as opposed to being capsule is because the protein matrix in the milk can bind together with some of the some of the bacteria and allow them to travel through and to survive the stomach acid, for example. So there is some data that they can have a benefit in some people some of the time, but it's certainly not reliable and reproducible in the same way as say drug data might be. So I agree with that Sophie and the point I would make for the audience is we, we have to distinguish between finding that the um, number of bifidobacteria in your colon has risen and finding that there's been some measurable difference in the way your colon works or that your symptoms have changed. Um, there have been really, I hesitate to use the word quackery, but there have been really a very, very small number of adequately controlled trials of these products in the way that you would autom automatically demand for a prescription medicine uh, in, that, in, in that sense. And in fact, I'm only aware of one proper placebo controlled, uh, double blinded, randomized control trial. And in fact, that uses a much higher dose of probiotic bacteria. And there's only one study which close, shows a significant difference in terms of bloating um, in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. So, I mean, if, they, if you enjoy taking them, my view would be uh, enjoy taking them, but don't necessarily get too wound up about um, pharm pharmacy issues because we may be talking about things which just might make you feel better. Okay, um, next question question um question on um is there a plan in place to introduce prescription management services nationally and if so what time scales question there for zara i think um again i think the this is is probably the way forward 
But again, as I said, I, COVID has come at a time where a lot of um, these things have been put on hold. So I really do not know what the time um, frame looks like, just from a local pilot that we did, as I said, that was extended by six months and we're having great difficulty engaging the ICS now. Um, so um, there are little pockets of prescription management hubs around, and I just do think we need a bit more data before this is presented at a higher NHS England level. Okay, um, question I think to Sarah about exercise after surgery. In general, is there an optimum time for starting exercise after surgery? And I, and I guess specifically the issue here is in relation to parastomal hernia formation. So um, that's a question we get all the time. I'm sure you do as well, um, Gordon. Um, you know, how soon can I get back to doing X, Y, Z? And it's completely individual depending on the person and also depending on the type of surgery the person's had and how extensive that was and how complex that was. Um, you know, if you compare different types of stoma surgeries, you've got surgeries which may involve complex reconstruction, that's going to be very, very different to somebody who's had a relatively non-complex uh, keyhole surgery. So it depends on the type of surgery, the complexity of the surgery, also how well you were going into it, your fitness history. So there is no one size fits all. And that's one of the problems, you know, we're doing some work at the moment in the process of trying to sort of come together with some national guidelines about this. And it's really, really difficult because everyone's very different. So sort of in a nutshell, um, the way we, we sort of try to describe it is the Association of Stoma Care Nurse Guidelines suggest that you can start some of the kind of abdominal exercises that I was showing in the workshops today, sort of pelvic tilts and things like that, really simple breathing exercises at around three to four days post-operatively. And that's very surprising to a lot of people. Um, but we're talking about breathing and we're talking about pelvic floor, gentle contractions and knee rolls, very, very simple stuff you can do in bed. Um, now that wouldn't be appropriate for everybody, but it would be for a lot of people. So we start there, we build up. And again, the ASCN guidelines say that around about the 12 week mark, we should be back to doing most activities. But again, that might not be right for everybody. So it's really around being very mindful um, of your own ability. What I say to people generally, if they've been very fit before surgery, when they return to their activity, um, to think about reducing it by about 75%. And that's where they start again. So for me, that's a quite a good benchmark. Because a lot of people who were fit before might start too soon and try and do too much. So if they were a runner or a cyclist or a swimmer, they would reduce what they did before by about 75%. And that's quite a good benchmark. Um, so it, it's, it's very difficult to answer that question clearly, but start with the core stuff as soon as you can. Um, and then build up there really, really gently and just kind of see where you go. The six week thing is a bit of a misnomer. It's like everything magically gets better at six weeks. So we need to kind of use that benchmark intuitively um, a little bit more, I think. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers that question. Can I, can I just make a point that, uh, in fact, we, we discussed this last year the way we look at post-operative recovery has changed massively over the last 10 years or so. So when I was training, you had an operation and you stayed in bed for quite a long time. For example, it was not unusual to have an inguinal hernia operation to stay in bed for two weeks afterwards. Um, and things have changed massively because our understanding of the post-operative stress response and the way in which people recover from surgery has changed. So by the time I became a registrar, for example, in the early 90s, some of my colleagues in Newcastle were doing studies, research studies on patients who'd had the biggest operation you could possibly imagine. For example, an esophagectomy, which involves opening both your abdomen and your chest and showing that people were actually able to get on treadmills and start walking uphill briskly two or three days after surgery like that with no adverse effects whatsoever. And what they actually showed was if you do that, then actually people have less post-operative fatigue. And one of the reasons why people have post-operative fatigue, we now know is that because we let them lie in bed for a long period of time. And you know yourself, if you have the flu and you take to your bed for a few days, 
you often have quite marked fatigue lasting several weeks. The notion that someone would be harmed by doing moderate intensity exercise, even immediately after surgery, uh, is now very much regarded as an old fashioned concept. So um, that's what I would say in terms of recovery in general. I think there, are, there, there is actually published guidance from the American College of Surgeons on abdominal wall repair for patients with large incisional hernias. And that guidance has been out since about 2007. And it's quite interesting because the, the, there's no guidance published in this country, but the American College of Surgeons recommend that if you have a large repair of a hernia in your abdomen, you should refrain from heavy lifting, by which they mean anything heavier than 10 pounds, for about um, getting on for six weeks. And then after that, they say some restriction may be necessary for about six months. And they're talking about the heaviest weight. And then after that, you can lift whatever you like. And when you talk to American surgeons who do complex abdominal wall reconstruction, like George Donato and Mike Rosen at the Cleveland Clinic, they will tell you that they let their patients lift whatever they want as soon as they want, as soon as they feel able to after undertaking reconstructive surgery. So what I would echo is Sarah's point, listen to your body, listen to your body, listen to what your body is saying. And I tell my patients, if it hurts, stop doing it. But if it's not painful, you can do pretty much whatever you want as soon as you like um, after major abdominal surgery. OK, um, we have another we have a couple of minutes um, question that I, I saw asked earlier about um, this is for Sophie about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah, um, I can see that one. So yeah. concern about higher risk of so small bowel bacterial overgrowth is as it, exactly as it sounds. So excessive bacteria growing within the small bowel. We abbreviate it to SIBO, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, and ultimately, we don't know what's normal in terms of small bowel bacteria. So we have a reasonable handle on what normal small bowel bacteria looks like and uh, how we can test for it in people who are in continuity with their colon, so who haven't had bowel surgery. But we really don't know what's normal in anybody that has had any kind of bowel surgery. A few of the risk factors for SIBO would be things like constipation, for example, or slow transit. And of course, if you live with an ileostomy or a pouch, it's very unlikely that you're going to have slow transit or problems with constipation. So actually, we would hypothesize at this stage of the game that people who have uh, an ileostomy or a pouch are at lower risk of SIBO than other people. And therefore, for that reason, it's absolutely fine for you to try some fermented foods if you get on well with them and you enjoy them. Lovely. And the same as the other sorts of things. So there's no concern. I have no concerns at present about people with an ileostomy or pouch being at higher risk of SIBO. It can happen, it can happen in anybody, but I don't consider anyone uh, who would be in this category at being at higher risk than anyone else in the population. I agree with that, Sophie. And I guess the other question you'd have to ask is, so what? Yeah, um, exactly. So if you yeah. have, I mean, I think there's probably quite a lot of people out there, particularly with Crohn's disease, who may have a bit of small bowel stricturing. And if you do the test for it, you will find that they have a degree of small bowel bacterial overgrowth. And the truth is nobody knows what it means. Um, it's something you can measure, but it's not known necessarily to have any adverse consequences at all. It, it's a diagnosis in some cases, um, looking for um, an illness to be associated with it. There's no doubt some people get malabsorption of food because they have significant overgrowth. But I suspect in many cases, it's just something that you find if you look for it. And we don't really know what it means. Yeah, if we tested enough people with without colons, everything else, many, many people who have no symptoms at all would test positive for SIBO. And so actually, we don't know what's necessarily normal in the general population anyway. Exactly. OK, so um, we are we in fact we're two or three minutes over. So I'm going to wrap this up by um, announcing the Inspire Award winners. Um, the IA Award for Innovation Inspire recognises the member organisation, which is in the opinion of the judging panel, initiated an innovative activity or a project during the previous year, either to support its members or to promote IA locally. 
And um, the award was Carolyn Stammer's leaving gift to IA. And as chair of the executive committee, she'd been particularly impressed by the work being carried out by member organisations throughout the country. And Carolyn thought it should be rewarded in some way at the same time as introducing an element of competition. So um, the award itself is a beautiful and engraved glass award. And this year it's been won by Lincolnshire IA. They've produced and laminated A4 posters about the services they provide and posted them with a covering letter to 100 local surgeries. So that's done a huge amount to support patients. I'm very glad to see a thumbs up over there. Um, thus advertising the support that IA are able to provide on offer to people undergoing surgery and giving contact numbers. So I thought that was a fantastic piece of work and well done. Um, so um, I think that pretty much brings us to the close of the information day. Um, I have to say that I think this has been a great uh, information day. I think it would have been even better if we were able to admit uh, to meet face to face, but hopefully, hopefully next year we'll be able to do that and get back to normal. I think we've we've done the best uh, with what we've been able to do under the circumstances. Uh, and I'd personally like to thank um, all the speakers for all their hard work. And I'd also like to thank Callum uh, for giving a great Brian Brook lecture. And I know um, that Brian Brook would have been extremely impressed and, and, and very keen to hear from allied health professionals to surgeons, and in particular our medical and dermatological colleagues looking through the list have been probably um, slightly less well recognized for their contributions to this field and that's something as national president I'd like to try and rectify over the next few years. So um, for attendees you will be receiving an evaluation questionnaire by email in the coming days. Please complete it, it will help us design the next meeting to meet your needs more fully and in addition you can uh, there's an opportunity for you to suggest subjects or speakers and uh, that you'd like to cover in the future. If anyone would like to invite Angelina Jolie, I'll see what I can do to make that happen, but I can't guarantee anything, of course. Um, and again, once again, thank you very much for Carol Cate for all the hard work in getting this organized. Uh, and that point, I think, uh, good night and have a lovely evening and weekend.